Hello and welcome to Overlapping Dialogue, a podcast of audio commentaries dedicated to discussing cinema that fascinates us in a way we hope fascinates you. We're your co-host, Kyle and Levi Huffman. I'm Kyle. I'm Levi. And we decided to dedicate this very special episode um, in honor of the 20th anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks, which of course occurred on September 11th, 2001. It's a day that weighs very heavily, I know, on both of our hearts and minds. And as we're going to talk about, very much informed kind of the uh, men we've become in the years past, certainly the time that it occurred had a huge influence on a great many of our worldviews, of our ideas, conceptions of the world, that of course was not a permanent state, but nevertheless was an inciting state and nothing else. Um and again, this is you know, this is a bonus episode. So again, you know, we're not going into an audio commentary this week. We'll we've done plenty of those already, and we'll be doing plenty of those more in the future. And so t- today, we just wanted to take a day to kind of have a conversation and come to terms of sorts, I guess, with what this day has meant for us, uh, both at the time and the years since, what it means for our country, not just our country, but the world in general, the impact that it's had. Um, in the later portions of this podcast, we're also going to get into, of course, some of the film and television that was influenced by the September 11th attacks and the aftermath. Um, again, this is ostensibly a film and to a certain degree a television podcast, but we wanted to open up with, again, talking about the day itself and what it's meant to us. And again, we know that 20 years removed, you know, in some ways it feels like just yesterday and in other ways it feels like two decades have passed. Um, before we dive into this long-ranging discussion. And we have a an outline of sorts, and who knows how closely we're going to hew to that and mm-hmm. how much we might stray away from that. But um, we just wanted to go over, first and foremost, um, the day itself and some of the lives that were lost as a result of these attacks. Yeah, so, um, of course, it occurred on a Tuesday morning. Um, I believe it was, yeah, from about... 8.46 to 10.28 overall in the morning um, would have been, I guess, when the first tower was struck. Um, the The two towers were struck and collapsed. The Pentagon was hit on one of its sides, um, and there was another plane that was intended either for the White House or the Capitol building that crashed in um, a field in Pennsylvania um, due to a very brave group of um, passengers on that flight who overtook the plane but were unable to um got it towards any sort of landing and crashed and there were no survivors um overall there were almost 3,000 deaths um including the 19 terrorists that perpetrated it um and there were about 25,000 injured um but even a number like 25,000 I think even doesn't even begin to um really get at the heart of what this event wrought on the country both literally in New York City and across the whole nation of just a disruption unlike anything um, that I think the country's ever seen or the world has ever seen in certain ways um, and I think you know that's interesting to bring up that number because I think you know now we understand and even at the time and 20 years ago we were having a better understanding of but especially even now, Obviously, when you hear wounded, you think of these physical wounds. Mm-hmm. You think of like you know um, whether it was shrapnel or uh, glass in in in, the, in you know shoved into people's skins or these very horrific kind of physical images that we bring to mind when you think of that and many of the images that came out of this attack. But also, you you know what do, that number likely doesn't account for. Obviously, is the post traumatic stress and the psychological. Yeah. This harm that did to people, both not only in the New York City area, not only in the D.C. area, not only in Pennsylvania, but across the whole country, and mm-hmm. again across the world in many ways. Um, um, and you know those numbers, I you know yeah. I think very much don't necessarily get to the heart of that. Right. It's just a you know those physical injuries, I would imagine. Um, but yeah, I guess. What do you think? There's more we need to say about that. I mean, I think that it's a uh, an event that if you're coming to this, you're probably well aware of the events um but i guess to dovetail into what we're going to talk about next as far as the memory of it i think 
uh, lives in people's minds differently, yeah. um, I think, and that depends on when you were born, I guess, which is the next I, thing. I briefly told but, this story um, at the end of last podcast, but I want to tell it again yeah. for those who weren't able to hear it. Um, I'm a high school social studies teacher. I'm an American history teacher. Levi, you're a middle school ELA teacher. Uh-huh. Um, and th- just this past May, I, as I was coming to the end of the semester, I was thinking, you know, so many of these kids I have now, I'm not going to have in September, and, and I'm planning on this very Friday, uh, when this episode's actually going to drop, to have a conversation and a discussion about what this day has meant. And, you know, um, again, these kids today uh, that are in high school that I'm yeah. dealing with, many of them were born anywhere between 04 and 06. And um, I knew that, you know, many of them were not even alive at all uh, when the attacks happen and even quickly i'll say in re- in comparison my students were born in 2009 so that's right. almost mm-hmm. even 10 years right. removed even so, far, yeah. farther removed right um and so i was thinking you know i want to at least show some footage of these attacks and maybe talk about them and what they meant and whatnot uh this this past may and i'm going to do a version of this again this friday and what struck me is how many of the kids, and again, I'm not saying this to bash the kids. In fact, mm-hmm. I'm trying to make a point about this. No. Is that yeah. many of the kids look kind of awestruck and dumbstruck. And in all three of my classes, a version of this same thing happened where a kid raised their hand and said, Mr. Huffman, is, uh, is this real? And I said, what do you mean is this real? I said, it looks like a video game or a movie or something. It doesn't look like something that really happened. And part of me, I mean, my in my mind, yeah. I'm ju- I'm going through all these reactions in my head. I, there's a rush reaction that is almost mad at the kid. Says, yeah. "Are you are you crazy? Like, of course this is real." Um, but very quickly, that gave way to I think what ultimately needed to be thought about, which was a sense of calm and a sense of like, oh, and a realization that these are not images these kids have been raised on and have yeah. been imbued with in a certain way. And so I had to take a step back and humble myself for a second. And realize that, again, a great many of these kids, they were not alive. They have no understanding. That for them, it's something that their parents or their grandparents may talk about in passing. But the culture in general has moved on. And I don't necessarily think that's as bad of a thing as sometimes people act like it is in terms of, uh, of what are we going to do, dwell on these images forever and just be mm-hmm. captive to them? I mean, in yeah. many ways, that's what the perpetrators of the attacks would have wanted to yeah. happen. Um, and so naturally, life moves on. Life passes. You have new generations that come about. In the same way, I had to be taught about the Pearl Harbor bombing. I had to be taught about the uh, JFK assassination. You know, the things that for other past generations were these huge um, inflection points in yeah. terms of their awareness of the world and whatnot. I know I was even thinking about this, that my own, uh, our father, Rick Huffman, was nearly a right about my age when the Kennedy assassination mm-hmm. happened. And so I'm, you know... Uh, very aware of that. Um, and so we wanted to just spend the kind of opening bit of this talking about our own awarenesses of the attacks. I was in third grade at Hudson Elementary School. Of course, it was just any Tuesday, nothing yeah. big deal. You're a kid, you know, so you're just worried about what's for lunch and, you know, whatnot. Um, I remember the day being normal at first. We have an art teacher. I believe he was still there when you he were was. there. Uh, mm-hmm. Mr. Baker. Yeah. Uh, Mr. B, B we everybody called him. Called him. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, he always had um, usually some, like, uh, you know, morning news on or, like, yeah. always something playing on his TV. And he usually had it on mute just as background images yeah. or noise mm-hmm. or whatever. And I remember walking out into the hall. I don't remember exactly when this would have been. And seeing a bunch of people crowded around the room outside of the door looking at the TV. And at the time, I just had no idea what was going on. I could have, it could have been a, you know, a episode, episode of Barney for all I yeah. knew or Sesame mm-hmm. Street. I had no clue what was going on. And I'd learned later, I believe, that the there were some fourth or fifth graders that were in there at the time and that I'd heard also secondhand, I don't know how true this is, that they had been told not to tell some of the younger Mm. kids in the building what had happened and what they had seen again i was in third grade at the time and i remember at the end of that day um our grandmother uh irene huffman picked me up always from hudson elementary school and as soon as i got in the car she immediately kind of placed a hand on my lap and said um there's nothing wrong but your mom needs to talk to you about something today naturally i was thinking what could this be i thought i was in trouble honestly i thought what, Mm -hmm. what could this be and then I remember getting home, 
and my mom was already there and I, I'll have to ask her about this at a later date. I can't quite remember the details. I don't know if she got off early or she was just getting off that time anyways. I can't quite remember. Um, my dad was, or dad was not home yet. Um, and I remember my mom, she kind of grabbed me by the hand and said, now Kyle, don't be scared. Don't be alarmed. But there's been an attack at the World Trade Center in New York City. And I remember thinking, well, I know we're in New York City. I've heard of New York City. Mm -hmm. I don't know, really know what the World Trade Center is. Um, and it's one of those things after you see all the images of the days to come, years to come, that you kind of retroactively remember, uh, oh, I yeah. think I saw those years ago, yeah. but I can't quite... And you but, have an understanding of what that represented right, to the, right. America. But and, for right. so many people yeah. my generation, that that's how they became aware of them yeah. in a fundamental way. You can't not see them and not think of yeah. that. And I think right. even a great many other people likely that lived for decades in New York City or... Or just were aware of them, saw them in movies or whatnot, or yeah. TV. Um, I would imagine a version of that is still true in terms of you can't see those buildings and not think of that, divorce right. them from that no. uh, reality. Um, and I, really, in the days and weeks and months and years to come, all I can really, the biggest thing I remember is soon after she had told me that, the TV being turned on and seeing over and over and over again those planes uh, strike the buildings. Um, even less so did I see the Pentagon attacks mm -hmm. and there was no footage of course of sorts of no. the uh, United 93 flight right. crashing because there was no one there it was just kind of this anonymous field in Pennsylvania where that happened I remember seeing the wreckage there mm -hmm. but nothing of the actual strike itself right. um, so again for me it was just on a deeper level as well um, I, of course, as a kid, you're like, who who would have done this? What 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 was behind this? And you're told, well, these terrorists, these uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalist terrorists from uh, these other parts of the world that you never heard of. You, the place like Afghanistan, it sounds like and they were uh, trained they, they, in Yemen, I think, or yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. you just hear about these places you've right. never heard about. All of a sudden, most of them are from this place called Saudi Arabia, and you're like, well, what is that? And yeah. uh, you hear about a place called Afghanistan, and you and then uh, Iraq. And you see that. a little thing called Iraq on yeah. the uh, there, and then people talk about this place called Iran. And so, what's unfortunate is, and this would have happened inevitably in some roundabout way, but my whole generation's uh, cultural memory of understanding the world in a fundamental yeah. way was shaped by this. Because I try to also think back a lot about retroactively. I'm like, okay, what was my conception of the world prior to this? You know, of course, you see globes growing up in schools, but you don't, you know, you don't really understand even within the United States how big the United yeah. States is. You're like, oh, New York City's here and Florida's here, and I think by that point I had been to Florida in the or late nineties, um, you know, Disney World, um, and so that is just your whole introduction to the world and um, all, you know. The continents itself, North South America, what the Middle East is, what Europe is, what Africa is, what Asia is. My whole generation's conception and yours as well of the world was informed by understanding where these certain places are. Mm -hmm. That this is where, quote, the enemy lives, or this is where, quote, those who perpetrated these attacks are from. And so, obviously, a coming of age in many ways is about uh, understanding some of the ways in which those facts you've been told are true. And the ways of which they're faulty. Uh, sometimes, I think, uh, due to benign mistakes. Yeah. Other times, because of very clear uh, obfuscation of uh, information or of ideology. What's, when you, what comes to mind when you think about your whole conception or understanding of what these attacks meant yeah. at your young age? You, now, let me just also say, I was born in 1992. I was just a few weeks short of being nine years old in third grade at... Hudson Elementary School. You would have been just have passed your third birthday mm -hmm. by this point. What do you? What comes to mind when you think about this time? Well, of course, I have no memory um, of the attacks in the moment. That's something I've just that I have never had any memory of. I think part of it is because I was so young, and also it was probably hidden from me far more um, as an event. But what I remember so much about my childhood is the war on terror and for like you said inform my whole worldview that thankfully i've worked my mind out of not that all of those like you said assumptions were negative uh but it's just a way of viewing the world that um relies exclusively on fear and um and even at a young age i felt like i understood that at a certain point 
But what's so strange about growing up after the events of 9-11 is obviously never understanding what any of it meant. Um, and I remember very directly the uh, the election of 2004 yeah. um, between George Bush and John Kerry, that being my first presidential election, I remember. Um, and knowing that the Iraq War was a thing, um, and I remember Saddam Hussein's death, um, I remember more than anything, uh, really when fifth grade was when, uh, in 2008, when uh, gas prices went really high because of the troop surge that had happened in Iraq. In 07 and um, yeah. yeah, and that um, I remember it got up to $5 a gallon. I had this very, def- I'm going to get back to 9-11 yeah. in a moment, but I'm kind of trying yeah. to trace all these things in my mind that, uh, I remember sitting on the bus at Hudson L. Mary School, and my bus, my bus driver, and a bus driver beside of them, beside of us, talking about how high gas prices were getting. And I was like, okay, well, and it was, I think it got up to around five dollars a gallon. I think I don't remember the exact number, but it was really high, which makes me think, and this is kind of a, going off in a tangent about gas prices when people complain about them, which is yeah. something that a lot of people do. Uh, that I always, there's always this gut reaction trigger in my mind that says, well, they'll never be like 2008 with five, well, or I, they won't, not that they'll never be, but it's not like 2008 when it was $5 a gallon. Another thing, too, about so, 2008, obviously, that was in the midst of the housing crisis yeah. and the, and the, the Great flu Recession and was the all thing. that. Yeah. yeah, so there was a lot of stuff going on. That's what I remember most about that era, frankly, is when I was coming more of age and beginning to even minorly understand these things um the housing crisis was a little bit different because th- and i say this with total fortunate you know that that was something we didn't have to deal with as a family that i know a lot of other people did and yeah. uh but that that something that never made a total amount of sense to me either but now it does and i and i see that now as really terrible and in the moment i kind of understood you know that the economy was bad but but anyway to say all this is just i guess is to say all these things were made totally normal for me um it really took until only really about two years ago um when i was doing my student teaching my uh partnership teacher was show it was actually around 9 11 and he was showing this documentary about uh which is kind of famous i think it just showed you said on cnn last night interestingly uh about those French filmmakers that were documenting a rookie firefighter in New York City and they happened to be filming the day that it happened and they captured all this footage that is really... Some of uh, which I know, I um, I didn't start watching it last night. I've always heard about this documentary. Um, That they even have footage from within the towers. Yes, they do. They um, went in and they got out in time. They kind of rescued some people. And there's part of me that wanted to step and watch it, but then another part of me... Wasn't sure if I was even ready to see that, frankly, yeah. and so and so, so yeah, I that's didn't. what I was gonna say about it is that it took me honestly until that moment, and this sounds strange to say as of already having been twenty years old by this point, but it took me until that moment to see the images of the planes hitting the towers to really. It's not even like I like what your student said, where it was like, "Is this real?" I knew it was real. My whole life was almost based on the fact and my perception of the world was based on the fact that that was a reality but to truly see it that's when i first really saw it as an image um and it made me sick i mean i i've i've never seen anything like that it's weird because i've seen it my whole life and i think that's the the unfortunate reality of my own perception of the event is it took this long to get to this point of maturity and age to really understand and yet further not understand the horror of the, the image and the event is um, unlike anything ever captured um, on film or seen by anyone um, is that uh, level of mass murder on such a high scale that goes even beyond uh, seeing war take place because it's typically obviously not to do with civilian lives not that that makes any difference but of Mm -hmm. civilian or military lives but that it's just something that is so unnatural um 
and foreign to human understanding that it boggles the mind in a way that it never had until about two years ago for me. So therefore, it's a very strange topic for me that I continually wrestle with on a on a level that I've yet to even fully grasp, I think, because the 2000s as an entire decade politically is something that I'm fascinated by and haunted by because I grew up during it and I feel like I didn't understand any of it in the moment as I would not I don't think anybody expected right, me to yeah. um, because I would have turned 10 years old when that housing crisis occurred and the gas prices were that high so for much of that there was no expectation that I understand it but I feel this sort of um, responsibility now as a teacher to even more to help people who these people who are even further removed from it than me to understand the true gravity of what the event means um so i know that was kind of a rambling no, explanation yeah, no, of that, that but yeah. it it represents something that goes beyond politics and and religion even it it, it approaches a question over humanity that I don't think we're ever going to be able to answer of how these things can happen and why, which there are causes and answers for these things, but um, but there aren't at the same yeah. time. Um, I'll go ahead and so, say yeah. as well right here, and if I didn't say it already, we're not really going to delve into politics a lot during no. this podcast. Frankly, neither of us have a lot of interest in doing no. that. Um, because while there are clear causes and effects for a great many of why much of why this happened, um, frankly, to quote, place blame on anyone other than the perpetrators, or the hijackers yeah. of that day, uh, I think is uh, reckless and yeah. uh, short-sighted. So when I so some of the things we're about to talk about understand that that we're not trying to get political, we're trying to just illustrate our own. Um, Evolution of our ideas yeah. in many ways. Because events such as this, like what I was kind of saying, go beyond the pale of human understanding of how and what would possess human beings to do something this drastic and rash and destructive. Um, and that it, 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 go, it goes beyond any sort of political right. partisanship. It just is, it just is its own level of, like, mis you know... Uh, mystery that I just you know. It should also be said, be I think, too, solved. that just to uh, illustrate our own perspectives, we are two uh, men from Western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. We have never, neither one of us have ever been to New York City. No, we've been to Washington D.C. You've been in the Pentagon. I think. No, I no, haven't. You I've been to, to Pentagon City. Okay, yeah, never but mind. I haven't been to the Pentagon. Um, no. But for us, I mean, as tough as it is to talk about, and as traumatic as it is. For us, there is inevitably this distance. Yeah. There is that, like, mm -hmm. it's something that's always happened on screens. It's yeah. nothing that's ever really felt like has impacted our lives. I would imagine a great many people, of course, in New York City that day or who lost loved ones or who were there to see it, it is comparable to a warlike experience yeah, in is, terms of the post traumatic yes. stress mm -hmm. that those people underwent. And so also understand that we are people who are not directly impacted by these things. We're people who have seen these things from afar. And can't help but have some observations yeah. on them, but nevertheless, there is this distance and there is this remove that we naturally have. Which from that. is what, and I won't get into this, but which is what frustrates me so much about trutherism is because I find it to be so disrespectful of people who stood there and watched it happen, and people who survived, and especially those who lost their lives. That for that to happen, for them to have these opinions in quotes about or what they call facts about these things is another level of you know stupidity frankly but anyway yeah. that's as political as i'll get about this but. um and this isn't i don't think that tough or radical to say that we're raised in a more conservative area mm -hmm. uh and so much of the immediate aftermath of those events and the years that followed was naturally an adoption of an us versus them mentality. I'm not going to act like that was purely a conservative phenomenon. No, that was a Liberals, bipartisan uh, patriotism. Yeah, it yeah, was. It, it was. was. Yeah. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that as well. Um, but there was this very clear us versus them mentality. It's and the them being anyone usually of brown color. Yeah. Um, 
you know, even in the 2000s, like there were so many debates, of course, as there are in most every other era about immigration um, and regarding Latino immigration and how that oftentimes got conflated with national security concerns or concerns over uh, Arab or Middle Eastern peoples coming to the United States. Um, and again, I want to say that I think for a lot of ways that is a natural phenomenon to all of a sudden be scared of, especially if you're coming at it from our angle, we were younger, mm-hmm. didn't quite understand or have that level of empathy built up yet that um, it's oftentimes much more complicated than just the us versus them. Yeah. Because so much of what you learn about Islam growing up in school during this time was mostly an us versus them mentality taught within the context of uh, the three you know, Abrahamic religions, um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Um, and the older you get, you start to see that there are definitely clear umbrella connections. There are clear mm-hmm. Venn diagrams of similarities they share. But there are also certainly differences each of those mm-hmm. share as well. Um, and another thing, too, and you know, in a weird way, about the 10-year anniversary of when this happened, of course, in 2011, was in many ways a big personal moment for me, a big moment, uh, in terms of that's when I graduated high school. Um, and I remember distinctly as well my very freshman year in college in UNC Wilmington, going, over, going to Wilmington, um, and they got us all the students together for like uh um on the anniversary of September 11th I don't remember what day that would have been it would have been only a few weeks into my freshman year yeah. to create like a 911 standing you know yeah. uh picture they took right. kind of in honor of yeah. it and and I was kind of a little iffy about that and didn't go actually um I don't believe because I was around that time thinking is that exploitive or I, I just wasn't quite sure yeah. if I wanted to be a part of that. Um, and it was in college and I never became really close friends with necessarily any people of the Islamic faith or, um, you know, I, I didn't yeah. become close friends with anybody that was that, but I did start to meet some people mm-hmm. and did start to, you know, gr- gain a greater understanding that, Oh, wait a minute. Like this whole thing I've been told that all these, you know, the people who, uh, worship the Islamic faith are all the same thing is far more complicated and then you get to realizing that it's not all that different from Christianity in the sense of all the sects that exist yeah. and all the differing opinions that exist. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately, that's the value of education. The value yeah. of education is you thinking the world is this big, and when I say this big, I'm like very small circle in my mm-hmm. hands, to realizing it's much larger and bigger than you and your own understandings of it. Um, and it would seem as though, I think as we're going to talk about here in a little bit, that America on the whole did not reach that same level of enlightenment in the sense of seeing that maybe even, and when I say understanding or rationalizing these attacks, I'm not saying making excuses for these attacks one bit, but I'm saying understanding why people would have the views that they do to hold these views against Mm -hmm. America. Um, I say this as I'm wearing an uh, uh, Old Navy American flag shirt from 2015. Um feel as though my own patriotism isn't under question or shouldn't be, or who cares if it is? That's uh, people's own rights to question that, I suppose. But the fact that we still, we need to be a little bit more critical in understanding why this happened and why people would feel like this is uh, something that's possible to happen, right? Um, so for you, when we're talking about like coming of age up to a certain point in this world, what evolutions maybe in your own understandings or lack of evolutions you've seen in the culture do you observe kind of in well, for my own culture? self i kind of hit on this already but uh the normalization of violence um mm-hmm. on television in movies i mean that, and that's already been something people have been complaining about forever i mean with video games especially i mean people think people thought this in the 2000s they've been thinking this since the 80s i mean about violence in video games or violence in movies could even be sent all the way back to the Hays code i mean yeah. you know but uh, more so even than that, I'm not even going to touch any of that necessarily, but the normalization of violence on television um, in the news. Well, well, one uh, thing, let me just interrupt yeah, you very briefly, I forgot, is when the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003, which was, of, uh, of course, entered into under false pretenses, mm-hmm. um, in March of 2003, I remember, like those airstrikes, seeing those airstrikes on TV against the Iraqi forces, and it looking like a video game. And, and yeah. there's been a lot written about this over the years, that the night vision goggles that were used to shoot, and it looks so far removed, and it looks so different and other. Um, 
it would seem as though the military and the media both learned that that up close and personal uh, nature in which Vietnam was portrayed on television was something they wanted to move away from and not really show that level of They had of done that with the or, Gulf War, too, yeah. um, about Same 10 thing. years before. Yeah. But, yeah, um, just uh, seeing the Iraq War play out on TV and uh, just, oh, you know, this is a normal thing. I mean, I remember seeing stuff on TV uh, about... Is some, you remember this. It's something we honestly used to chuckle about when we were younger. Now I look at it in, in horror that there was some thing on the History Channel um, that was like talking about these, you know, soldiers that uh, I don't remember what the whole deal was, but basically it was that the documentary thing about them going to their armory, which they called the candy store. You yeah. remember that? Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, thinking that was just so absurd even then I la- but now I look at that and I see that as this conflation of normalizing war mm-hmm. because that's something we just have to do right you know to get this revenge on this thing and I and you know like I said we're not going to get all the political things of that but just the uh, you know how unfortunate it is that I grew up in an era where these things were just all over the TV um, and I know there's other people that live in the worldview of that still in certain ways. Um, but, and thankfully, I think that being in times of peacetime, I think that we've transitioned out of that somewhat. I don't think we are as in that as we were mm-hmm. in the 2000s. Um, but there is a certain amount, and we're going to talk about this later when we talk about superhero movies, there's a certain amount of destruction in films that is seen Normalized. as normal, normal now. And it's a movie. I mean, you know, it isn't real. I don't want to get too bogged down in this, but because what I see more of the problem is is, the, is news mm-hmm. and documenta- documentary source normalizing these things because I think that's what the most, uh, uh, you know, disturbing versions of this are. But um, also, you know, as, as another side note, just seeing the leaders on TV all the time, and now we don't do that. Yeah. We don't see that as much anymore, which I don't find anything particularly wrong with. But one of the defining images of that era is Colin Powell holding up the, uh, what was that? Sample it was of the chemical sample weapons. Of chemical the, weapons the, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And seeing things like that, and I'm like, I don't know what that means, but I'm going to support that, you know. And uh, just... Uh, well, as a kid, you know, you know as a kid, it, it was just so easy to have the lie conflated that... Um, Al Qaeda and Afghanistan and Iraq and Saddam Hussein are all part of one big and the Taliban collection well, of yeah. and that it actually and as a kid you're like yeah well they're from quote that part of the world yeah. and we have to quote fight them yeah they're the quote bad guys right. and the older you get the more you're you almost again it's kind of like what you said earlier you're almost as a kid you almost feel a sense of guilt that you went along with certain things mm-hmm. and didn't understand it but then again you're like well I was a kid I mean how yeah. how could I understand the nuance and the problem and the fault is that a lot of adults in the room, yeah. um, whether it be in your own family or whether it be the culture in general, are not standing up and saying, hey, wait a minute, what is going on here with your conflation of these things yeah. together? And yet, at the same time, to give those people just a little bit of grace, which was most of the country, so, you mm-hmm. know, uh, it was a time of, of great confusion and great disillusionment and fear and mystery that now we've tried to put to bed and not even think about because we're kind of out of that. I think it, I'm paraphrasing. But, I believe it was Dick Cheney said, never let a good disaster go to waste. I believe is what he well, said. There you go. One of, one of the one of the great spokesmen, spokesmen of the era. So, you yeah. know. Um, so when we talk about, quote, what does it mean? What does this event mean? When it's going to be this Saturday, Yeah. what's that going to mean to you? Well... Let's see. I wanted to look at what all I had, we had written some notes down written here. Down. Let's see. Yeah. So, um, I honestly, and this is going to sound, a lot of people are going to chafe at this. Like I said, I, this would probably be one of the more, I guess, controversial in quotes people that I would say that people would think this. I don't think that America takes 9-11 as seriously as they should have or do. Um, now, there's a lot of people who do, on very basic senses, that, I agree. I totally agree with about this is terrible. We need to remember the people. Yes, yeah, so, and you know, of course, I think a lot of people do that. But I think that what America going into its twentieth year of continued grief over this, 
or forgotten grief in some people's senses. Or misplaced grief. Uh, or misplaced, yeah. Is uh, not having really learned what we needed to learn from this, and especially uh, this coming in the midst of everything that's going on in Afghanistan, it's almost it's almost too perfect to have been written by anybody that this would occur coming around the 20th anniversary of 9-11, that there are people, and what you kind of were alluding to a moment ago, there are people on this earth who don't see things the same way that we do. That much is clear. Um, and that there are people who do not want democracy. Um, and that that is a sad, you know, uh, byproduct of the idea of democracy is that there are people who can say, no, I don't want to do that. Um, and that's not saying that the citizens of those countries don't want it. It's clear that they do, or at least that they don't want to be under the Taliban and Islamic fundamentalism. But at the same time, um, you know, that is a re- ultimately a reflection of a part of the world that doesn't that doesn't prize a lot of the same things that we do uh, as you know uh, very fortunate citizens of a country that is democratic. Um, so, I guess what you kind of wrote down for me when I was talking about this was, can democracy be a global phenomenon? I'm not sure that it can, and I think that's something that uh, America has time and again ever since the Korean War or even World War II in Korea and Vietnam um, and South American wars and all kinds of things that we have been part of, that we continue to not realize that uh, that part of democracy is realizing that, okay, well, people have the voice that they say no um, and that we keep trying to force that and force that on uh, groups of people who that is uh, diametrically opposed to their worldview. Um, and I think that's the great tragedy other than everything about the tragedy of 9-11 is that we didn't learn really anything from that as far as geopolitically. Um, uh, many would say that, you know, Vietnam should have been our lesson yeah. for this. Mm-hmm. And going back to something earlier I meant to mention is that a great deal, you know, in many ways I'm a student of the 1960s and 70s. I, I really am fascinated by the period in a deep way. Um, how much of the conflation of not understanding what this difference between North and South and yeah. the Viet Cong and it's just well us versus these Vietnamese people well, it's like that's the simplification of it right and yeah. it's just it's just that and it's like well eh, there's all these little other sects and all these other understandings of it and again it's like we repeated the same exact yeah. mistake again well and I think uh, and, I, of and I think in the cases that. of these uh, counterinsurgencies that we have tried to uh, you know, hold up. Uh, obviously, I think the United States government understands that there are different sects of people uh, and different ideas in these countries, but they, uh, and I won't even talk about their handling of these things, I'll say more of, but the, I don't think the American people understand that. Yeah. And that's something that the government has not made clear enough, um, or the media has not made clear well, enough. Well, probably a combination. And so... That, I think, is what the problem is. Another thing I've been thinking about about this is uh, the idea of... I'm fascinated by the 1990s because it's an era of transition, which I think, and we were talking about this the other day, I think is one of the most violent decades. Yeah, I was actually going to mention this conversation uh, when you were talking about how the normalization of violence in the 2000s, and in many ways the 90s has this stigma of a, quote, peaceful time. But as we were talking about, we came up with two handfuls or more worth of very violent... Yeah, irrational I mean, incidences that actually plagued the '90s that were kind of papered over right. and, and have been forgotten about after something like this happens. Yeah. And it all—it's like how the '50s got papered over in yeah. the '60s. It's like, oh, it was all a time of peace and prosperity. It's like, yeah, well, for some people it was, but for a great many other people it wasn't. And even well, again, the '50s, there's a lot of awful stuff going on. And but then the '60s came along and it seemed that much exponentially yeah, worse. Right. And the same thing happened, I think, with the '90s and the 2000s. Yeah, but with the '90s that. You had obviously we to list all these things would take forever, but you had to uh, well m- mainly the end of the Cold War I think projected this sense of calm over the over America, not the globe. Uh, and but and that, the idea of Western right, democracy, right? And the generally. idea that Western democracy prevailed, and that was the worst idea to go into the two thousands with because everything that happened. Let me just tell this brief story real quick. Yeah. Uh, I had a, a teacher uh, at App State. 
Uh, he was taught. He was a uh, history of the Soviet Union was the class yeah. I had. And he talked. He asked us one day. He says uh, early on, he's like, "What what defeated the Soviet Union?" You know, somebody said Reagan. He says, "No, not really." And somebody says, "Well, uh, what about Star Wars and spending you know all this money on military?" Yeah. He says, "Well, maybe kind of that." And there people threw out this or that, and ultimately he said it was Levi's jeans. It was Coke. They weren't talking about Pepsi. mine. It was McDonald's. Were, yeah. He yeah. was saying basically yeah. that back in his day when he was growing up in the like the uh, like mid to late seventies, early eighties, when he was really coming of age, that like on the black market they would be trading Levi's jeans, and they and some of them were counterfeit. Yeah, it was about trying to suss out which ones were, and that ultimately you know, yeah, we quote won the Cold War. But in many ways, it was this version of neoliberalism. It was this version of capitalism that won the Cold War. Yeah. That, yeah, sure, Reagan plays a role in, but is part of a decade-spanning public relations campaign. That, in, you know, yes, yeah, sure, the nukes. Yes, yeah, sure, uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles. Yes, yeah, sure, M1 Abrams tanks. But also Levi's jeans, but also McDonald's. That's ultimately the... And those well, are things that Marxism over. cannot provide. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the collapse of the Soviet Union ultimately is due to its own self and yeah. and the uh, mismanagement, but yeah. also the appeal well, of and what the, the appeal West was, of Westernism. Yeah. Yes. So so in that sense, uh, everybody remembers the nineties, like you said, at a time of peace. But you had uh, Somalia, mm-hmm. uh, genocides in Rwanda and Bosnia. Um, Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh with the Oklahoma City bombing, Waco, um, Rodney King. Uh, yeah. beating OJ murders the Ramirez brothers murders um, well even it's different Columbine uh, at the yeah, end of the decade Columbine. Yeah. even something that's a more social thing it's not quite violent but yeah. even like the Monica Lewinsky yeah. Clinton scandal in right. terms of exposing certain level yeah. of hypocrisy there um, uh, but oh it was great the you know right. for me it was the decade of the Rugrats or Rugrats yeah. and it was the decade yeah. of you know Batman Forever mm-hmm. and like you know, as a kid, you and I was actually thinking about this. I think I, as a kid, like late nineties, early two thousands, I had a vague memory of hearing about the Lewinsky stuff. Um, I do actually kind of remember Florida and the, the two thousand election mm-hmm. and all that, and that was starting to get me understanding. Wait a minute, people run for these elections, and like, uh, there's people saying this person won Florida and this person won Florida. So you know, this, yeah. This. But anyways, right. There, but, but the nineties yeah. was much more. So, divisive decade right. than many people. So that during that decade, the and the United Nations had existed, uh, you know, since forty five, nineteen forty five, but that that was really when the United Nations seemed to be everywhere. I mean, in Somalia and in especially in Rwanda and Bosnia. I mean, just as an example, half of the Malu United Nations movies uh, for Malu UN mm-hmm. that we watched in the class we had with, uh, Dr. Tom Perry, who's a saint, one of our favorite, yeah, our, if you're fav- listening to this, Perry, our favorite, we love you. yep, we love you, our favorite teacher ever. Um, that half those movies, I mean, the Behind Enemy Lines was a movie of that, Tears from the Sun, um, uh, Hotel Rwanda, Hotel Rwanda, the only one of those that's good is Hotel Rwanda, by the way, but, yeah. um, but a lot of those having to do with, you know, 1990s, Geopolitical, geopolitical problems, and pretty much all of those have something to do with the United Nations, Espe- right. especially in Hotel Rwanda, as Nick Nolte was like kind of the main... Black Hawk Down, win. did y'all watch Black it? Ca- yeah. yeah, and Black Hawk Down, that was the other one I was forgetting. But a lot of these have to do with these, like, okay, humanitarian aid is happening, and who, of course, was the leader of a lot of these? The United, United Nations. Yeah. I mean, the United States. Within the United Nations. Within yeah. the United Nations. Um, and, 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 and it's all, in and of itself, the United Nations was a body or an arm of the U.S. to work right. out this Western Except Depart- for yeah. the fact that during Rwanda, the Rwanda genocide that uh, Bill Clinton was wary of dealing with such a thing because of what had happened with Somalia. Yeah. So that was a little bit more of a Britain and Canadian-led yeah. United Nations effort. But um, that this was seen as this time of, okay, we're, but we're going to... I mean, everything is collapsing in the 90s, especially in Eastern Europe mm-hmm. was... Uh, and I think a movie that really, by the way, hits on a lot of this was 71 Fragments of a Chronology of Chance, the Michael Haneke film, uh, being in Europe in the 90s and really thinking about a lot of these things. Um, but Because it's not expressly about that. It's about a mass shooting. Um, that's another interesting movie that I want to bring up now before we get talking about movies later that I think is a pre-9-11 movie that kind of explores a lot of these mm-hmm. things that isn't at all about a lot of that stuff. Um, but that, but that anyway, it, it, 
with that and then of course the uh, you know the war on terror this sense of that uh, democracy can fix everything and we're just going to keep going in and doing these things the United Nations is a very integral important um, organization that honestly I wish got more attention and did and was able to do more work yeah um, but um, it's a great but, idea but it also cuts through the heart of What's the difference between upholding universal human rights and state sovereignty? Mm-hmm. Which is a question the U.S. Right. has been dealing because with this entire because time. Because a lot I of mean, these nations that we're talking about do not support universal human rights. That's not something that they uh, want to do. And what's the? So, well, and again, I don't. I don't have an answer for this. This is a rhetorical question. What's the line between respecting someone's culture? And saying that's wrong, right? And that's ultimately the question we're dealing with with Afghanistan yeah. right now that we've dealt with forever. So that's basically what I, I guess, have to say about what it means. That seems like a lot, but just to boil it back down is what what is democracy when when it can't solve everything yeah. and people don't want it? And I think that's the thing that whether we we what we were doing before 911 right. but also what we've done with nation building since 911 yeah. and that uh that's something we've never dealt with on uh especially on a citizenry level uh that I don't think that people understand the nuance of that and that like I said I think is more of a fault by anyone than the media and the government itself I don't think that's the fault of the american people so much as uh the media, the media and the government. And everybody talks bad about the media and the government all the time, so I'm not trying to do that either because I get tired of hearing that too. But, uh, I mean, yeah, there it is. So Yeah, um, like you, I'm also very fascinated by the 90s. Of course, we were both children of the 90s on our way. On way. I was born mm-hmm. in 92. You were born in 98. Um, and like what we were talking about the other day about all these crises within the 90s that kind of got papered over after the events of 9-11, as if they had in no way were telling us something psychically or in the, you know, I know the yeah. zeitgeist is a tricky term, but trying to communicate something to us that we weren't maybe quite paying attention to or understanding. I don't know. Um, but that um, one thing I'm very fascinated by, by the nineties, when you look back, look back at a lot of the art and entertainment of that time period. And this wasn't in everything, obviously, but in certain strands of things, this grappling with the end of the millennium, the end of oh, what's what does it mean when we're going to see the clock struck two zero zero zero? Like, is that going to yeah lead to some fundamental change in our ideas or our thoughts or whatever? You can see this in a great many movies. Um, Until the end of the world, some of our favorites. Um, something like uh, Infinite Jest, I think, deals with some of these questions. Uh, Mal two that we're going to be talking, mm-hmm. we're going to bring up the author of that Don DeLillo a little later towards the end of this. Um, there's a lot of just you can see it from the intellectual class yeah. of people uh, at this time really grappling with okay this quote Cold War is over what's next what's the next step how do we move on from this right um, even in some way I think Vinland by Thomas Pinchon's a version mm-hmm. of this although it's set principally in the 80s um, okay what's next what's the next step how does it? What does it mean for America to be the quote sole superpower in the world? And is even such a thing possible? And you know this whole notion of you know uh, neoliberalism—the fact that okay, now that the Cold War is finished, and now that we put the Soviet Union in the ash heaps of history, now we can free trade, we can globalize in the ways that we want. And that's everybody's going to love that. Everybody's going to love this globalization, mm-hmm. and everybody's just going to eat it up. Again, naturally, globalization in a great many parts of the world um, damages the power structures in which create sympathizers of groups like Al-Qaeda, like groups of Islamic terrorism. When they see their own power being threatened, um, their natural response is to form some sort of a coalition against what they see as the might of Western imperialism. Um, And again, I think that's something that it's just we just see the us versus them and again i am not making any kind of excuse for the death of thousands of innocent lives okay um but we need to understand how and why people may react that way because you don't totally truly understand your quote enemy unless you understand the perspective in which they're coming at you with if they're just clearly just a blank face and they just have an ak-47 then you're not going to really understand who they're doing this for and why they're doing it now, it totally feels like I'm switching gears here, but I promise you this will connect. 
Um, a movie that I've been thinking about a lot, and I've only seen it a handful of times, and it's something that you recently saw for the yeah. first time, so it'll be a chance for us to talk about it a little bit here on the pod, um, is A Few Good Men, of all things. Now, A Few Good Men came out in you know the early to mid nineties, ninety two, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know that movie was a cultural phenomenon, of course, based on Aaron Sorkin's own play play of the same name, and he wrote the script and also Rob Reiner directed, stars of course, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson, Demi Moore, a seemingly disconnected courtroom drama from some of the things we're talking about. But the more and more I think about that movie, the more and more I go and you know go back and watch scenes from it or watch it again, beautifully on 4K as it was recently restored, um, I can't help but see the metaphor of actually what it's about. And I think if we're going to understand what leads to 9-11, we have to understand the discourse, what was before that, and trying to give us a view into, okay, what exactly is the conversation? What's the discourse? What's being said? And very famously, the end of A Few Good Men deals, of course, with... Tom Cruise browbeating uh, Colonel Jessup, played by Jack Nicholson, who is alleged to have ordered a code red, which was basically a discipline of a discipline of a, uh, a private, I believe, at Guantanamo Bay, and that's mm-hmm. an interesting thing to bring up here too. With this, is that it takes place in Guantanamo Bay in the early nineties um, to discipline this uh, soldier, and it accidentally led to his death. Um, and this whole question of, well, actually, one of the guys that he was going to inform on uh, the Santiago who was killed in reality inadvertently I believe shot into Cuban territory and that could provoke such an act of war that such a person needed to be put down to quote preserve freedom mm-hmm. and again this feels probably to some so disconnected from 9-11 or like how does this rea- relate yeah. but you see in Jessup the distillation of a military industrial complex and establishment that above all else prizes safety and security over personal uh, accountability, responsibility, liberalism. And I'm not talking about the liberalism of liberals versus conservatives. I'm talking about the idea of the United States as a globally liberal nation mm-hmm. in terms of it offering liberal democracy, right? Something that, again, Republicans and Democrats, I believe, would agree is something that they want to see around the world. Yeah. And so... You know, you see the agitation of Jessup building up very famously in that scene, and of course he finally explodes and admits, yes, you know what, I did order this to preserve this freedom and whatever. And the movie paints Jessup, I think justifiably so, as a, quote, the villain of the piece as he is. But I also don't think the movie, and I think the the narrative and Sorkin understand this, totally come up with a rebuttal to what his response is at the end. That you want me on that wall, you need me on that wall, you want people like me to defend this nation, yet you want to decry our methods, right? And I'm not saying that he's not the villain of the movie, because I think he is, but also the movie, I think justifiably, is not answering with any kind of big monologue on Cruz's part. Yeah. It's letting that criticism stand as is, and make us kind of feel a little queasy about the understanding of the knowledge that we are putting people in these leadership positions. Now, again, Jessup himself, as he mentions in the movie, himself was, you know, came from uh, the Vietnam War. And so you would think he would have, you know, uh, learned from such mistakes. But instead, he decides to double down on some of that same decision making. And in trying to prevent crises, inadvertently causes one. And I think that is one that the United States in most of the 90s leading up to the September 11th attacks um, was a mistake that was being writ large with that nation that you can see even being dramatized yeah. in this single colonel at this one obscure place called Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, yeah. which, of course, 10 years later is going to be the detention center for a great many of the terrorists who were captured in the war on terror and brought there. Um, so, again, you might be thinking, what does uh, a few good men have to do with all with September 11th, the war on terror? I mean, as two people ourselves who are cinephiles and love art in general and literature... We look to these things to inform our own understandings of the world, right? Mm-hmm. And they're not trying to necessarily offer us answers, but they are asking questions. And I think in asking questions like that, ideally, we are getting some sense of awareness in our own faults and our own strengths, uh, what have you. Um, the movie doesn't necessarily end on this hopeless note. In fact, it ends with, um, I can't remember that, the guy's name, the guy who was kind of the one who killed, main guy yeah. who killed Santiago of him being very disgraced and embarrassed that his identity as a Marine is now going to lead to his dishonorable discharge, something that he held so much identity in was this being a Marine serving his country. And that, 
you know, Cruz inevitably kind of says to him, I'm paraphrasing here because I can't quote Sorkin's brilliant dialogue back to you verbatim exactly here, but something along the lines of you don't need stripes on your arms to prove that you're a man of honor or a man mm-hmm. of dignity or whatever. Um, so, and no, if nothing else, I think that's an illustration that we can learn from our mistakes and we can choose to turn the page. Um, but again, more often than not, when I watch that movie, when I think about it in the context it was conceived in and produced and you know, viewed, then in many ways it's giving us this early warning sign that how far are we willing to let our the military-industrial complex, the Pentagon, those who frankly are seeking to enact forever wars, if nothing else for job security, um, in this sense of a lull conceived of a time that, the okay, the uh, Cold War is over, that that energy, you know, if you remember your science classrooms, matter nor energy can be created nor destroyed. That energy has to be transferred to somewhere else. And for so long, that energy was transferred to shores that we had no idea what was going on over there. And then you hear about, oh, the, was it 93? The World Trade Center yeah. was bombed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then also uh, the USS Cole bombing, I believe that happened in 2000. That such things feel like this distant memory. When in rea- reality, they're creeping closer and closer to our shores and then inevitably explode into something as horrific as the September 11th attacks. So that's a movie randomly I find to be, if not exactly therapeutic, enlightening when it comes yeah. to trying to understand some of these systems of power here in the United States. And that's frankly all I can do. I can only really truly criticize the United States in this because frankly the other culture is one in some ways I don't understand. Yeah. Um, I can get some understandings of, but ultimately it's not my culture, right? Um, and so I think some people would chafe at the aspect. Why are you criticizing America in some instances? Again, there's a, you know, I'm the sap that when the uh, Pledge of Allegiance plays every morning, I put my hand over my heart and I say the words out loud. Mm-hmm. And I'm someone who believes that creed. Yeah. But how can you truly love something without being a little bit critical of it? Um, and that doesn't take away from all from the heroes and the ones who lost their lives that day. But we need to understand and grapple with how does something like this happen and are there self-reflections we can make to prevent something else like this from happening? Something else I uh, said here as well is what happens when the reaction is worse than the event? You see this with the Iraq War. One of the most enduring images to me of Vice, a movie we'll talk about later, is the scene where... George W. Bush, played by Sam Rockwell in that movie, is tapping his foot as he's giving a speech he's nervous, uh, yeah. about uh, we're going to invade Iraq. And, Iraq yeah. and then it juxtaposes or cuts to some anonymous Iraqi father who's kind of uh, holding his children in his arms. Under as, the uh, table. Under the yeah. table. And he's doing the same foot reaction as well. And, you know, um, you know, as a country, I think more and more people over the years, you start to hear people have said the Iraq War was a mistake and we shouldn't have yeah. done it. But it still, frankly, isn't at the fever pitch it should have been yeah. in 2003. Um, and also you hear a lot of people say, well, you know, in the days after September 11th, you saw American flags everywhere and everyone was united and everybody was together. Um, but if it leads to something as destructive and uh, horrific as the Iraq War... Um, did we really learn the lessons that we should have, should have, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that we did. Um, again, American flags everywhere, but to what end, right? And that doesn't mean that you can't have pride in your country, but also express doubt or uncertainty in what we're being told the reaction should be to these horrific attacks. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's two last things to say, and uh, I would say about this. One of which... Um, there's been a lot of hand wringing, of course, in how the Afghan war in Afghanistan is being uh, resolved. You could say the end of this 20 year journey that inevitably is a loss for the United States. In many ways, we're licking our wounds and asking some of the similar questions we asked at the end of Vietnam in terms of our own stake in the place in the world. Mm-hmm. Something that we've uh, observed a lot recently, of course, is the unfortunate death of 13 U.S. service members mm-hmm. who died in a. Uh, Suicide bombing, suicide bombing yeah. attack in Kabul. Um, justifiably, there's been a lot of memorials and mournings over those unfortunate uh, brave souls who lost their lives in that. Yeah. Um, not nearly as much has been said about a retaliatory predator uh, drone strike that we had in Kabul that caused the lives of 10 family members of a single family. Um, ages 9, 10, 40, 20... 30, 3, 4, 2, 
some of the ages of some of the kids killed in that. These were innocent Afghans, by the way. These were innocent saying. Afghans who were yeah. killed in the, quote, crossfire of this. A quote from a CNN article that talks about this. Uh, they were, quote, an ordinary family, a brother of those who killed said. We are not ISIS or Daesh, or in, and this was a family home where my brothers lived with their families. Relatives of the victims spent Monday at a Kabul hospital identifying remains and separating them into coffins. The two-year-old girls, Malika and Samaya, were among the names marked on the coffins. At a funeral held later in the day, family members ch- shouted, Death to America. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they be aggrieved at the fact that we, in the process of trying to resolve this war and this retaliatory act, killed 10 innocent people, including kids less than five years old? I mean, um, you know, you don't hear anything or see anything about that here in America. You only ever hear about these, again, unfortunate loss of our own service members. But that is ultimately what the problem with trying to grapple with these things are the lack of empathy going across these various cultures, right? Um, you know, and I one thing I really desperately worry about, and it's not something that hasn't been talked about all that recently until even maybe just recently in terms of these what, the resurgence of this war in Afghanistan yeah. in recent weeks. Um, what I really s- terrifies me is the number of terrorists we have created in the years since September 11th attacks. And while we may never see something on par with September 11th again, God willing, but it could also happen, unfortunately, um, what acts of small acts of terror are still going to rob American lives, not all that unlike the innocents that have been lost in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I'm not going to end on a totally negative note on this because there was a, a recent New York Times article just published today that was about... Americans stretch across political divides to welcome Afghan refugees. Quote, even the most right-leaning isolationists are coming forward to help those fleeing Afghanistan, a pastor says. A mass mobilization is underway. And in that, it described basically uh, so much of, uh, you know, all the Afghan Afghani refugees that have started to try to come to the United States. I mean, if nothing else, for all these criticisms you can level at the United States, one of the most enduring images in the most recent weeks has been seeing those people cling to the plane, the C, uh, you know, the C-14 or whatever it was, uh, cargo plane, of those people clinging to the plane wanting to go. Now, are they wanting to come to America? Are they wanting to escape the Taliban? You know, that's somewhere in the middle with yeah. likely many of these people. Um, and, you know, the responsibility we now hold, okay... We upset this, you know, whole region of the world. What are we going to do about those lives? Are we going to encompass them into the American experience? Which, again, both Republican and Democratic communities across this country are saying, actually, we may. Okay, which I think is undoubtedly a very positive thing. Yeah. That we're going to take in these people and that they themselves can become a part of the American tradition um, and part of the American way of life. And, you know, there's a lot to be discouraged about by a lot of this stuff. But I frankly find that to be something encouraging and say, mm-hmm. well, if nothing else can come out of these 20 years, perhaps they can be included in the American experience and they too can experience democracy just in the same way that white, black, men, women, gay, straight, whatever people here in the United States are mm-hmm. to this day. That was, I know, all over the place, but I try yeah. to sum that mm-hmm. up as clear as possible. Agree. All that. So, yeah. so, as we said, we want to talk a little bit about the film and television they, of course, have been inspired by 9-11. That's more, of, uh, more in our uh, comfort zone, maybe, of things to talk about because yeah. we have a little little bit more awareness of that. Um, naturally, I mean, we were watching film and TV at that time. You have uh, literally, in many ways, just in the same way that what was on CNN or what was on our news screens informed our understandings of the world. Of course, Hollywood and television are going to inform our own understandings of the world as well. Um, we broke down um, a great many of these, um, what we call tiers, of various modes or genres almost in which either the events of September 11th or the aftermath and its war on terror or even just kind of much more abstract social ideas were filtered in through. Yeah. Um, tier 1, a direct adaption, uh, a direct adaption slash depictions of the attacks themselves. Three that we immediately seized on and decided to mention were United 93 and World Trade Center, both of which came out in 2006. Now, we recently just saw World Trade Center for the first time a few days like ago. yesterday. 
Or no, no, it was no, it was Saturday. Saturday. Gonna, Never mind. Yeah. I forget what day it is. So um, yeah. I'll open this up. I guess to you, Levi. I see what you have to think. What do both of these things to you represent in terms of dramatizations of these attacks and the people who experienced them? Well, first of all, uh, as you probably know if you've been listening to this podcast, I'm a big fan of Oliver Stone. Um, I find his uh, inability to create coherent messages to be uh, fascinating. fascinating and enjoyable. Yeah. Um, and I agree with a lot of certain things he says, but he never really get he's never really gotten there all the way to coherence. I think, except for this. Um, which is almost so neutered in, in 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 comparison to his other works. I think in re- recognition that okay, I can't play around with nine eleven. You know, in his case, I would assume he thought that. Um, but at the same time, even though it is very kind of a very basic movie, very blasé, just kind of like all right, here's what happened. Uh, what I think I appreciate about it is that it does really, of course, champion the. Uh, dedication of the first responders um to uh just running into harm's way and um putting their lives on the line to save people that uh they weren't even sure if they could get there or not um and of course the whole movie primarily concerns uh nicholas cage and michael pena being trapped under uh the rubble um and actually living um but um, yeah, I think it's a. I think it's actually a pretty good movie that randomly a lot of people don't really like. Um, I think it was kind but, of. Um, this is something I want to talk about later with Delillo. I think somebody like Stone's reputation, the expectation was you're doing a quote nine eleven movie that he's going to solve it. He's yeah. going to tell us what we need to know. He's going to be the one to really like save the day, right? And sometimes artists like that who have the reputation for being either these soothsayers or being these you know grand provocateurs or um, prophets. Sometimes the responses to some of these things, I think, are uh, disappointing to some people. Yeah. And they don't get what they wanted or they expected. And I think that was kind of the case with Stone with that yeah. uh, in that way. United 93 has been much more lauded and talked about as a, an experience. Mm-hmm. And that movie really is an experience yeah, is. More, than, more than anything else. What about that sticks out to well, you? Well, I think that's the best, uh, the best by far direct and one of the best just in general movies that has anything to do with 9-11. Um, because I think what is so great about that, like you said, is the uh, very harrowing experience of the movie, and that has one of the greatest, most breathtaking, sobering endings to any movie I've ever seen. Um, but the whole movie really does put you in that experience of... I believe, uh, too, doesn't it have uh, some of the same air traffic controllers actually portrayed themselves? I think so, I think, yeah. yeah. And it, it's, it's a movie that... There are a couple actors that we would we would recognize of being random bit part actors and things, but it's a pretty starless anonymous yeah. movie. Um directed by for Paul that. Greengrass, uh, who made some of the of course Born movies and a lot of other stuff. Um in the Green Zone, which I guess we'll be talking about in a little bit too. Um but he, he in many ways is a quintessential nine yeah, eleven era yeah, filmmaker um, in terms of um, all But I just think that it is. works because it, it actually shows the hijackers quite a bit as well as the uh, the victims, um, and shows the direct opposition which takes place on that flight that uh, those people stood up to that and saved how knows how many who knows how many lives to, uh, yeah. by sacrificing their own. So I think it's a really serious, uh, impressive experience of a movie that if you haven't seen we definitely recommend and this isn't to diminish world trade center because i think what it's trying to do is quite admirable in its own way yeah um but in many ways it fits into a much more traditional hollywood disaster filmish yeah template and you know three actually feels like a bold piece of cinema in terms of actually trying to do something that's different and new i mean even that style that greengrass employs in a lot of his movies at that time was fresh yeah, out of the box and right. brand new and it's and then yeah. he uses in a lot of the born movies particularly. i wouldn't but, call it art house but compared to world trade center it's it's a lot it's a lot different i mean more, it, more it's, unconventional yeah certainly um another movie we wanted to mention really quickly alongside this because i wasn't sure where to put it in yeah. these is the report which came out a few years ago I've you, still yet to yeah see. you haven't seen that i have but uh it's pretty good but that's of course about um trying to get the information about a lot of the uh, CIA memos about uh, torture 
and their use of outside parties to carry this torture out, which uh, clearly didn't work and was disproven now, to have any efficiency. Yeah. That, and it's kind of a docudrama as far as that goes, because it, it is a movie, but it, it's very much a docudrama. It feels like it's almost a uh, uh, reenactment in a way, a reenactment, yeah. Um, not that, you know, a movie like that and the subject matter is undoubtedly important in any era, but wouldn't that movie have made so much more of an impact if it came out in like 04 yeah, or 05? It would have, and it come out much later after yeah. the fact in 2019. Uh, well, of course, it's important to note that a lot of the information was not uh, yeah, freely given, yeah. and it took a lot. That's kind of what the whole movie's about, is them trying to get all that, suss all that out. Sure. Uh, and, yeah. But so that's a that's a pretty good movie. I mean, it's it's bland in its production sense, but it it, it says a lot of things about that that sure. are important and interesting. Yes, it fits in loosely almost to like a journalistic movie yeah. in terms of journalism and that whole yeah. genre of spotlight or yeah. like right. even, uh, all the presidents men or something along those lines. Yeah. Tier two, we separated into mean war slash action films that represent or depicted the war yeah, on terror. Which there's a lot of. Some roundabout sure. way. Um, just a list of a few of those that immediately come to mind. The Kingdom, another model UN mm-hmm. classic of sorts. <laughs> yeah. American Sniper, The Hurt Locker, Zero Dark Thirty, both of which, of course, were directed by Catherine Bigelow. Green Zone, Body of Lies, The Bourne Movies, Man on Fire, and also even the Bond movies, uh, yeah. the Daniel Craig era, I'd yeah. say Bond, which we're actually still in the midst of. We're there. Yeah. Um, one thing I that I think about when I see all those listed together, and this is true of a lot of war slash action movies, I think in any era or across the board, is what's the line between we're having fun and genre thrills of such a thing, but also questioning, giving enough broccoli out there to justify the quote dessert yeah, of movies right. like this um anything in particular stick out to you about some uh well moments or movies of those the kingdom i find to be one of the most gloriously pointless films i've ever seen uh i don't think it really gets in anything in particular it's a lot about i think it's i'm trying to remember everything the movie's about it's like about this bombing that happens on a, a military base in the middle east it's- I that thing, think that movie, it's that Saudi movie, Arabia. Yeah, I think that movie in particular yeah. is one of the most skeptical of our relationship to Saudi Arabia, yeah. which frankly always gets put on the back burner yeah. and never discussed. Yeah. Again, and the that's majority important. of the hijackers yeah. were of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. But that it's about an FBI kind of group investigating that because it was technically foreign, it technically wasn't foreign soil because it was on yeah. a military base or whatever. But And then it just turns into a action movie it's where Berg, Jason so, yeah. Bateman, get, oh, that's Peter Berg, yeah. of course it is, yeah. I forgot that, where Jason Bateman gets kidnapped and they have to go find him or whatever. And it's a cool action scene at the end, but it's like... Whatever. Also, the opening credits of that movie uh, like traffic heavily in the imagery of 9-11, which I find kind of disgusting. But um, American Sniper, uh, that was a movie that uh, myself, my mom, and my dad all went to see. Um, I saw it down what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a part of like this late Clint Eastwood series of movies that have uh, quite mysterious in many ways, and sometimes they're even their form. Um, you know, I think that's like one of the best per- lead performances I've ever seen in a mediocre to problematic movie. Yeah, uh, of Bradley Cooper in that, he was really good. I thought. Um, as is the case with a lot of Clint stuff, and I actually sometimes appreciate about this, I got no idea what a movie like that's even trying to say. Um, it's kind either. of very opaque, um, and in many ways comes from a certain world weariness that I think of anybody who makes a movie of that age, they're not going to have this clear ideological no. bent sometimes no. that they're going to be. Like, even like Oliver Stone in recent yeah. years, that yeah. he's kind of become more mysterious yeah, he's and all opaque in terms of what he wants to say. Yeah, And I think that's a strange movie that... Um, I know a lot of people from a more conservative political persuasion think a lot of and of Chris Kyle in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and what does it say about a culture and a society that we celebrate someone whose most memorable trait is the fact that they've killed a lot of people with a sniper rifle? Um, but I'm not saying that doesn't make him. I don't know. It's, yeah. it's a tough no, it's a question. complicated I don't, question. I don't have an answer yeah. for that, right. frankly. Um, because he truly believed in this country and... Uh, and served his country very clearly, but like you said, it's kind of a question of how much do we lionize individuals for simply 
doing their job i right. guess is all yeah. i mean and some people say well that's more than a job and i'm like okay well i guess so but you know what i mean it's just yeah. like kind of like where does it end i with frankly want to see yeah. the movie again because it's been yeah. a while it's an interesting um, movie i mean it, like like kyle said it's it's pretty it's a pretty forgettable movie actually but it, but it, i think bradley cooper's really good in it and i think it has some things to say i haven't ever figured out all the way one of the things i remember most about it is the michael moore controversy surrounding it some comments he had about the movie oh, uh, that. do you not remember that no, i don't think I do. where he said kind of some of the similar things we just said at least but some of his stuff was a little worse and yeah. kind of more ridiculous which that's michael moore as i say of a moderate somewhat yeah, we'll touch on maybe in a fan of michael moore not sure um but anyway that's one of the things it's I actually interesting more that we've it. gotten this far in the podcast and this is the first time we mentioned michael moore because even before I really even knew who he was to a full extent, he was all over everything in the 2000s yeah. in terms of a force for I mean, literally a about, whole movie, you know, American yeah, I mean, Carol, even going was over, made I mean, to, even going to know. the late 90s in terms of Bowling yeah. for Columbine and like, you know, Roger and Me and things he were doing even then. He was a, well, yeah. you know, I feel like he's kind of faded, gone by the wayside, and I don't, I'm not entirely sure that's he's a negative thing He's just kind of a talking either. head now, uh, and, you know, yeah, that nobody really wants there's to There's a whole to. class of filmmakers like him and Spike Lee that I think people more know as spokespeople or activists than mm-hmm. they even know. Which is what I think they ultimately want to be. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah, but The Hurt uh, Locker and yeah, Zero Dark that, Thirty I have are that. obviously both yeah. Catherine Bigelow productions. Um, the Hurt Locker, I think, is pretty good. I know it got um, it won Best Picture. I think it was for a while, probably still is, like the one of the lowest grossing movies of all time to win Best Picture. Really? I believe, yeah. It actually didn't hardly make any money, uh, hmm. but it, it did good on home video and years after. Um, that also kind of springboarded the career of Jeremy Renner, who hasn't exactly done much of anything yeah. since. He's, of course, been in the Marvel movies. Um, but one of the most in, in dear, you know, images that is seared into my mind in that movie, that, of a movie that I overall don't think a whole, whole lot about, is there's a scene where uh, Renner's character, after he comes home after serving all these tours, and Holmes ever only thing he ever wanted, and he gets there, and there's this shot of him standing in a grocery store aisle looking at all the cereal, yeah, and just kind of being overwhelmed and like, honestly, like this is what I fought for was all this, and not sure if he should celebrate, not sure if he should be confused, not sure if he should be angry, but just yeah. standing there. I mean, it's just an image, so you don't know what's yeah. exactly going on to his head, and I think that's what's fascinating about images obviously is that they bring whatever you want to with them and so that's randomly a moment i think a lot about in a movie I overall don't think a whole lot about but it's quite good yeah. um zero dark 30 that of course was made in it came out in 2012 only a year after the death of uh Osama bin laden uh what's your some of your thoughts on zero uh dark well 30? i'll say surprisingly and i just bought the movie on 4k a few days ago because we've been wanting to rewatch it uh I didn't like it very much the first time I saw it. I thought that it was, for lack of a better word, I thought it was boring. Um, mm-hmm. Because most of the movie concerned with the search. And then, of course, of course, I thought that, and this goes into the question of how much should I enjoy this. Uh, I thought the ending, the climax, was really well done, you know, um, of the actual assassination. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, a lot of the movie I found to be kind of dull, but I want to rewatch it now. I was younger then yeah, when right. I saw it, and I want to rewatch it now, and I think I would like it way There's more. There's a lot of controversy um, when that movie came out, I yeah. remember, about its depiction of torture. Uh, yeah, and but, in particular, yeah. I mean, the way I look at it, and I might change my mind if I see it again, but the way I remember it is like the movie is depicting what America is doing yeah. as bad. And people just don't like looking at it. Yeah. didn't like looking at it and criticize the movie, and I was like, well, shouldn't you be criticizing the people who are doing it? I don't know. But yeah, um, but yeah, I that think that's a, a good movie. Controversial uh, movie. The Green, about, uh, green Zone. Or Body of Lies. I green Zone and the Bourne movies I want to kind of yeah, put together. Ahead. I have uh, seen those. But, now, yeah. you know, the first Bourne movie, I think that came out in 2001 before the attacks yeah. earlier in the year. Yeah. I can't remember. It did. Uh, or it was around that time. But two and three adopted this whole um, something that is not in vogue at all now, and people usually criticize. Um, but at the time, felt very re- revolutionary. Two and three, the Paul Greengrass style of cutting and action scenes. Um, now across the board, I don't think that's necessarily great. Um, but at that time, was a bold new cinematic style that felt like added to the urgency and the uh, intensity of. Yeah, you know, 
those and those movies again are weird because I think they get thrown into this lump of time, but are, they're themselves not really about Islamic fundamentalism or Islamic terrorism. It's more about Jason Bourne versus the CIA in right. some ways, which in of itself, people at the time would have known were engaging in some of these wars. And that way, a movie that I didn't even really write down and would probably be stuck in another category um, is The Good Shepherd, which uh, stars Matt Damon. It is a very haunting kind of movie about the beginnings and the origins of the CIA um, from the perspective of one of its founders. Uh, uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, Matt Damon's character. Yeah. Um, and that's a very, again, it's kind of like a haunting, almost scary, feels like a horror movie in my memories. Munich is similar in that way that again it was yeah. made in 2005 I believe by Spielberg and that's about the uh, you know the, was it 72 uh, Munich Games Munich Games the Olympic the Games Palestinian the Palestinian terrorists killed um, off most and so of that the in of itself was a very important Olympic Spielbergian team. movie yeah. that and War of the Worlds also gets talked about made uh, at this time of Spielberg even trying to uh, yeah. deal with the moment Man on Fire and I, you know really Scott's did he, you talk about Green Zone Oh, maybe I didn't really. No, Real quick, no, Green Zone that. is, a, again, another... Matt, Matt Damon, actually, I think, is an underrated avatar for a lot of these movies. Well, he he's pops in too. In so. a lot of these, in yeah. terms of an avatar for America at this moment. Um, Green Zone is uh, fine enough, uh, kind of a, 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 unmemorable, but in of itself is trying to, like, say, hey, wait a minute, what were our reasons for getting into Iraq? Were they faulty? Were they, you know... Uh, not really the right ones, and so in that way, it's a historical document. You know, another random movie he... He was in Che Part Two. He was like the CIA kind of interpreter. Well, I would, I guess, interpreter is the right word because he he was talking between some of the like Bolivian government. But he was like basically the CIA yeah. person in the movie, and like that he's randomly in it, and you're like, oh, Matt Damon's in this, okay. Yeah. And that's just kind of another random movie he played some America, and that like obviously was in 2008, and it wasn't about the time. It was like in the 70s, yeah. but it, that's something interesting, I think. But anyway. Sure. Or no, late sixties. Anyway, whenever that was. But yeah. Uh, Body of Lies, um, and Man on Fire, both uh, yeah. Scott Brothers movies. Uh, mm-hmm. Body of Lies, of course. I've seen uh, Man on Fire, but not Scott. Body of Lies. Um, Body of Lies was good. That was around the time, and that movie is fairly, I think, critical of America in terms of its foreign policy and what it is doing in response to such attacks. But at the same time, again, it's a Ridley Scott action movie, so it's got certain itches it has to scratch, and that's frankly more what it's concerned with than being critical. And again, this, this whole genre movie is tough because I think, as I've already said, that this whole impulse that, oh, we've got to entertain people and make people feel like they're getting an action movie, but also being critical of certain aspects of American foreign policy or geopolitics in general, and those that just, you know, yeah. sometimes it's mm-hmm. tough. Something like Man on Fire, you can speak a little bit more to. Now, yeah. that's you know not explicitly about no. uh, the war on terror. No. That principally takes place in Latin America. Yeah. Was it Brazil? Yes. I can't remember. Let me yes. look it up real quick. But, uh, of course, Denzel Washington plays kind of a former uh, Crazy, was CIA it? guy. Um, yeah. Who's protecting this little girl. Dakota is, Fanning. Yeah. It's actually a remake. Yeah. Uh, also of another movie Mexico no Mex- that's no, right no, sorry, no because Mexico. yes it was about that's what I'm remembering now it was about the uh, what was that they called it I think it. I was thinking about Max Payne 3 you know, that takes place <laughs> in Brazil yes that does because yeah. that's very much a uh, I've played that game way too many times to admit that's uh, basically the same kind of story about these what do they call those those like kidnappings that uh, does it have a name for it there on the Wikipedia page? It's a specific type of kidnapping. I can't remember. Uh, um, I don't know if it says it or not. Well, it's like holding them for ransom, I guess. Yeah, like, I get. It. Well, but anyway, is this kidnapping that was that it was very widespread in Mexico at the time and in in parts of Latin America, I guess. I don't know, but that uh, yeah. Uh, would you could you briefly explain why you think this has a connection? Because I think I kind of get it, but maybe you could. Explain well, I it think better. it's again, it's like um, there is this sense of Hollywood action style that Tony Scott was one of the big innovators yeah. of, and in his own way, um, Paul Greengrass was himself mm-hmm. doing a version of it this time that deals with this fracturing of traditionalized uh, narrative storytelling, which in many ways feels like. 
the dawn of the 21st century in terms of the internet and this distillation of what's true, what's not, and just this general restlessness and this general feeling of uh, urgency, and that that style conveys a sense of urgency that is indicative of what is going on with Mm -hmm. the war on terror. And again, it isn't just about the war on terror, because I think the style was developing anyways to that point, but certainly is accelerated by that era in terms of, I think, the public's sense of awareness and um, fascination with wanting to weirdly be entertained and shocked and scared in a way in an action movie that they typically are in like a horror movie. Yeah. In terms of that sense of yes. propulsiveness and that sense of danger. And I think that in a weird, sick way, the September 11th attacks primed the American public for seeking out that feeling that they once got in horror movies sometimes now in these action thriller mm-hmm. horror movies. Yes. That okay. Makes any sense. Yeah, I think that fits. Yeah. And it being a former member of the United States intelligence community, I think, says a lot about that too right in that sense yeah yeah and again that movie's not explicit about terrorism no, exactly it but no. it is about uh the lengths of which we'll go to quote preserve freedom and or restore a sense of lost innocence right i think with that yeah. particular character now what about the daniel craig bond movies do you think well connect to maybe any of this obviously i think quantum of solace particularly because i was thinking a lot about casino royale but i want you to look up where that quantum of solace was principally i believe if I'm not totally wrong, was in the Middle East. Because it had a lot to do with oil. The Atacama Desert, South America. Well, I know there was part of it in South America, but... Uh, let's see. We're looking here. Mentions Italy, but then... Austria... Where's that tell on there? Where's that? Oh, that was it. I can't remember, but anyway, the point is, is that it was a lot about Italy and water. I mean, not Italy, oil and water, and a lot of these like natural resources. Um, and it felt as if uh, that's why I was misremembering that. I get now. I did remember that the ending of it was in South America. I did remember that, but uh, that well, it is this uh, desert this environment. Yes, right. That even can be conflated. I think by that's somebody what the point the is: is that it it's obsessed with oil and uh, these natural resources that certain people don't have. I remember that being a big part of it. Is I remember the shots from that movie about like water that people couldn't get or whatever. Um, and anyway, just that uh, that movie in particular is famous for being totally, not only narratively, but visually incoherent. Yeah. Uh, the editing is There's all over There's a time the where me and my cousin Philip were sitting there, and there was a chase scene kind of in the middle of the movie that yeah. literally we had to stop and we counted the cuts over a span yeah. of one to two seconds and there was like ten cuts. Yeah, no, it's a lot. I know seconds. the moment you're talking about. And it so, and to many, and people yes. were saying at that time, I even remember, that this is them trying to do Bourne with Bond. Yes, and and I, they're right. trying to take the Bourne style right. and apply it to Bond. And I think that that, along with randomly the Harry Potter films as they went along, tried to do some of that too. I think it was... Uh, the Deathly Hallows movies, you remember there's some of those sequences yeah. where it's just like, it was way too many cuts. So I think that ultimately what represents in those Bond movies uh, is this, uh, we talked about zeitgeist earlier about that as a term is kind of questionable, but uh, catching on to the uh, zeitgeist of uh, the speed and efficiency, well, efficiency in quotes with which movies were being made as, a, as somewhat of a response to uh, media being changed after 9-11, I guess. Uh, and some of the topics that were being chosen to be about that. Because Randomly Casino Royale is actually a lot about just very basic spycraft, but also a lot of African politics, randomly. Mm-hmm. Um, and that Quantum of Sauce was, like I said, a little bit more about natural resource politics, which I think fits a little more and into it, it probably, um, the world And it probably is inspired in some war. ways by the fact that we want to traffic in images that most people would associate with the Iraq war or with the uh, war on terror but we don't want to like they're having their cake and eating yeah. it too but we don't want to really put it there because then we'll be open to criticism Right. so it's like so by invoking these images or these ideas people will associate it with that thing but then also we don't have to actually make it about another that thing. thing another movie real quickly I'll, do we have anything else you want to say about Bond or 
Well, I think just in general that the casting of Daniel Craig, even in the Casino Royale, for the Bond franchise, represented a move away from like the Pierce Brosnan like well, quips and whatnot, yeah. and of like this very serious. Um, he's just almost like a thug of the state and a thug with a gun that I think represents this self-imposed seriousness that people saw the intelligence services of that yeah. time with indirectly right. as a result of all that. One other movie that neither of us have seen that I wanted to mention was Three Kings um, of being kind of like a Hogan's Heroes, sort of, or yeah. where they're like going off, or not Hogan's Heroes, Kelly's Heroes, oh, yeah. where they're going off and kind of like searching for some lost gold or something. Yeah, and that's in the that's uh, in the uh, Gulf War. Right. So it came I know out that's 99 a, it was before. Yeah. I know but, that's yeah. a little different, but that's also trafficking heavily in this kind of Middle Eastern uh imagery. So uh we haven't seen that so we can't really speak to it, but that's another thing I just thought of. I guess the next tier Yeah, was, tier 3 yeah. um and we're not going to talk a lot about this because no. we're kind of going to say refer to our hyperlink episode. We talked a lot more about this, but we wanted to at least mention yeah. it again. A film that actually, of course, becomes before the September 11th attacks, Traffic from 2000, but also Syriana, which, again, we've done a whole podcast on. Yeah, so that. go listen to that. We've as discussed well a lot of the same Babel, ideas there, yeah. The hyperlink movies of this time. We haven't really talked a lot about Traffic. We might have mentioned a little bit on Syriana, yeah. but what about that do we feel was uh, predictive or indicative of what the next several years were going to be in well, some ways what some of the yeah. warning signs it had some of the, the main order. things for me were the way that it's idea as we said we saw that after the fact yes and oh, yeah, you know yeah. we didn't see it before no but, that obviously. the appointing of the drug czar in the movie being michael douglas and uh his uh growing realization of the inability to deal with uh the the war on drugs and then creeping into his um, own home. Yes, and that his daughter is hooked on drugs, mm-hmm. um, and just the sense of uh, militarization of those things. Another random thing that's important to note is that is one of the only times in a movie where I have seen a person walk out of the White House onto Pennsylvania Avenue and get in a car, which is mm-hmm. so strange because that's right before nine mm-hmm. eleven had occurred, and that was changed after yeah. that where you can't drive on Pennsylvania. I've actually stood on it uh, in the front of it, but you can't drive on it and now. I know but. the Hyperlink movies, and we talked about this in that Syriana pod, have sometimes faced, I think sometimes, some justified criticism for like simplifying things and being like Geography 101 for dummies in terms of like, uh, oh, it's all connected, you know, like idea. But, you know, as people who come of age in that time, those movies were important for us to understand not only how these systems operate and how they interconnect, but empathizing with people from all these different cultures and people's uh, and understand and trying to get a grander, more holistic understanding of how, uh, for one thing, maybe terrorist acts can happen, as we see in Syriana with um, one of the characters in that that we talked about a lot in that. But also just how, um, really, more often than not, in a lot of these hyperlink movies, especially like Traffic and Syriana, that it's almost more a war between organizations for resources and it's about yeah. what how, what can we get over on someone else and what those conflicts and unfortunately side yeah. whole peoples individuals that get short-sighted or destroyed yeah. by virtue of yeah going to war and with then, those institutions yes. or and, just being a bystander to those mm-hmm. institutions and then Babel uh i've not seen that i've seen that and it, it's pretty good but i think that concerns a little bit more about the ideas of globalization um, and the, it's on a basic interconnectedness that is explored in hyperlink movies. Um, so it's not as much of a political, uh, expressly political movie, although it uh, part of it is in the Middle East and is very much concerned with that um, one segment of the movie. Another movie I really want to jump to really quickly before we move on that we should put in our action movie section Yeah is uh, Sicario 2, Day of the Soldado. Or even Sicario 1 to or an extent, even Sicario, but Sicario yes. 2 more yeah. actively includes itself into that. What about that brings to mind well, some of this? Well, it very... And I just bought the movie on Blu-ray and got it the other day. It's a movie I don't like, but I'm fascinated by. Um, One of the most laughable endings of all time. Yeah, we won't go into all that now, but that um, I think that that well, not I think. That movie very clearly... Uh, draws this very dangerous line between, um, uh, you know, immigration at the southern border and uh, Islamic terror. 
um, which uh, clearly doesn't exist. It's a right-wing fantasy. Um, no, I mean, it's literally putting two things that the right is very consumed by and putting them together mm-hmm. uh, in a very sick, reactionary, uh, fear-mongering, pretty disgusting movie uh, that I'm still fascinated by and kind of laugh at. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's a very ridiculous uh, sequel to a pretty great and instructive movie yeah. uh, of Sicario. Uh, but so... All of that should be there and very clear to think about what that means in regards to 9-11 uh, and the war on terror and the uh, the fear of Islamic fundamentalism um, because the movie kind of starts doing that at the beginning but then over time in memory just becomes very uh, base and... Uh, yeah. Expo- it's, a, it's an exploitation movie, very yeah. much. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because yeah. that's the one I forgot. But anyway. Tier 4... Yeah. Um, this is probably one of the more memorable, immediate things most people would associate, other than maybe those direct depiction movies, yeah. is documentaries. How do mm-hmm. documentaries define? And I already know there are a billion and one documentaries that we're not even going to bring up, uh, mostly because we either don't know they exist or have not seen them. So yeah. we're just going to go through some things. Something like Restrepo, I know, um, was a huge movie about the war in Afghanistan. I've not seen it yet, unfortunately. I hope to someday. I know that one of the co-directors of that actually was killed later on in Afghanistan yeah. uh, covering the uh, one of the wars. Um, Fahrenheit 9-11. I've still not seen this, going back to Michael Moore mm-hmm. from 2004. You have seen this. Um, what about Michael Moore in general makes him an, uh, <laughs> an avatar for trying to talk about some of these things? Uh, he has no shame. Yeah. Uh, that's the first thing that can be said sounds negative and it is it kind of it mostly is actually but also kind of a positive thing he has no he will say whatever he wants about something uh and of course he'll make up things that aren't true too which is part of what my problem with fahrenheit 911 is is a lot of assumptions that it makes about things i don't think are true um it makes but, a lot of connections, doesn't it, to the Saudi royal family and the Bush? Uh, yeah, family. because of oil, which I don't think is. I don't know how. I don't know about any of yeah. that. I, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of assumptions I don't find to be true, but I think it's ultimately right about a lot of things about what what fascinated and enthralled the uh, government in its wars in Iraq and Afghanistan um, that were not just for the reasons they said they were. Um, so I think it's a very instructive movie. Uh, it's very well made. I mean, he's a master filmmaker. Uh, um, but I think that he also, in the midst of his seriousness, likes to play a lot of satirical little games that I don't think are always uh, mature mature for what, yeah. for what the... Uh, Implications. Yeah, because there's one thing in that movie which is admittedly funny, but it's kind of like, okay, of John Ashcroft singing uh, a, a patriotic song, and at the bottom it does that like MTV thing where it says the name of the song by yeah. John Ashcroft. And it's kind of just like, I mean, that's kind of funny, but it's like... I what are you accomplishing here yeah. exactly and not so i have I, I actually quite like michael moore for the movies i've seen i think bowling for columbine is especially impressive uh but um and that movie has its own complications yeah. and controversies every one of his movies does i in mean some way. yeah but um but i think that ultimately my line on fahrenheit 9-11 is uh a uh, right a uh, pretty right on movie about a lot of things it says that but he feels the need to create and uh, divert and play all these little smoke and mirrors well games in some ways that goes back there. to not world trade center but other oliver stone films in yeah. the sense of he himself loves to maybe employ mm-hmm. conspiratorial yep. thinking and or um taking a tragedy or taking an event and creating seemingly history out of that yeah, right. and trying to and the and the detective game that has to happen of what's true and what's not and frankly we should be skeptical of every movie that depicts yeah. anything i mean and, but certain movies make that um investigation all the more needed immediately yeah. and somebody like michael moore or oliver stone you know I could see somebody think of them as cynical. Uh, yeah, it's uh, no wonder why people hated Michael Moore so much in the 2000s. I mean, I mentioned it very briefly earlier, American Carol, which is a movie we saw the day of. I don't know why. Yeah, um, 
in the movie I think about way more than I want to admit because I have a lot of thoughts on that movie. Basically, and, it's a right wing uh, parody yes, of, of, of Michael Moore and, and a lot of things. Through thing. the Christmas yeah. Carol, which is very strange, but. Um, and that one of the ghosts is uh, Bill O'Reilly randomly in yeah. the end or something. Well, he's not one of the ghosts, but he's in the movie yeah. very quickly for some reason. Dennis Hopper, I think, was one of his Dennis Hopper too. was in it as a, a judge, and he like shot the Ten Commandments where it says do not kill so that he could yeah. do that to the to the ACLU zombies. Yeah. We'll stop this here. It's ridiculous. Uh, but I'm glad we it, even mentioned yeah, this, actually, yeah. because it actually is a right. piece of this um, ephemera this time. Yeah, and... Uh, the fact that the right would be so consumed with the ACLU only wanting to promote civil rights and saying they are zombies is yeah. pretty disgusting. Um, but anyway, uh, that that it makes sense to me why Michael Moore would have been so loathed at the time for perpetuating a lot of lies. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of things that I, I find, frankly, I'm like, I can't believe you would make these connections. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, is getting at something far larger yeah. That I think is inherently true. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a very com- he's a very complicated individual yeah. that I f- I find very <laughs> uh, laughable at the same time as I find him very uh, clairvoyant. Too, yeah. But anyway, another yeah. obviously superstar documentarian, far less controversial, but not one hundred percent uncontroversial, yeah. of course. Errol Morris, two documentaries he made among many that immediately well, three, even. well three yeah. actually really yeah. yeah. Um, the first of which seems a little bit disconnected from this, but I think very much fits into this. The Fog of War from 2003, which was his profile of former Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, who, of course, served in the Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy uh, administration mm-hmm. into the Johnson years, was one of the key architects behind the failure of the Vietnam War. And again, interviewing him in 2003 is very clearly making parallels inherently to is he still alive then? He was alive then. Really? Yeah. Okay. He died some years after that. I was just, I didn't even know he was alive. Uh, no, I mean, the movie is a feature length. Yeah, because I haven't seen the movie. It's, so, it's okay. basically the Rumsfeld documentary, but about okay. him. Right. Um, and so it's an interview with Robert McNamara and him expressing a lot of doubt and concern with his role in the Vietnam War, but also sticking by certain um, truths that he believes were justified. Um and there's been a lot of debate about him over the years, whether he was, quote, a hero or a villain, and he's somebody that you can't easily put into either category, I don't think. Um, but in in of himself helping the Vietnam War reach its point of maturity, that in and of itself, what I think would make somebody more in the villain category. Yeah. Um, but again, it's a very fascinating reckoning of him trying to feel self-conscious about these things. Yeah. Meanwhile, The Unknown Known with Donald Rumsfeld made 10 years later is almost the same documentary, yeah. but instead about Rumsfeld. Yeah, because I've seen that. Um, he doesn't seem to be all that sorry about anything, and he's done. And there's even been criticism, I just saw in recent weeks even, or months, of people saying, while Morris had a great idea and a great um, reason for pursuing such a project, that did he inadvertently give rise to the sense of, uh, you know obfuscation of reality that we've seen so much in politics in the last like 10 years you know i would say for all his sins donald rumsfeld didn't invent such a concept that that concept's been around for a long time and will be continued to be around and if nothing else it's fascinating to see morris kind of grill him and him almost with a smile answer everything with a logic that while you may not subscribe or buy into for a lot of people is reality yeah. Uh, what about you? What do you think about? Uh, I don't. I don't find that uh, criticism to be valid, frankly, because uh, first of all, Rumsfeld digs his own grave. I mean, if you, you have to go into the movie knowing what you believe, and you're going to come out probably either way believing the same thing. Yeah. And uh, I do not find uh, Don Rumsfeld to be a, a role model. So, um, but. I mean, I don't know. I think that people, and I understand that, you know, that promotion of conspiracy is danger- is not only dangerous, it's uh, ab- abhorrent. But um, but at the same time, that's democracy. Yeah. He has the right to say whatever he wants to. Yeah. He is a human being. I mean, so I don't find that criticism to be valid, frankly, because it's like, well... Morris is just asking him the questions and he's answering them. I mean, you know, yeah. and there's kind of the moment of the movies at the very end where he's like, well, why are you saying all this? And he said, he just kind of laughs, Rumsfeld, and says, I don't know. Yeah. 
And uh, now, partially, he yeah. might feel like he had to defend himself for yeah, criticism right. he's been leveled against. And him. so, therefore, I just don't find that to be a particularly valid uh, criticism mm-hmm. at all because I think that uh, that's what democracy is, and people still get to do those things now all the time. Uh, and um, I don't like them, but. Right. Uh, if nothing else, it citizens, needs to exist for the historical citizens record. Citizens have the right to believe those things, as stupid as they are. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, again, if nothing else, it needs to exist for the historical record. Yeah, and that you know. too. So, yeah. Now we've not seen you've not seen standard no, operating procedure. Mm-hmm. Standard operating procedure, two thousand eight documentary Morris made about the Abu Ghraib uh, tortures and no, uh, uh, but I have seen some documentaries about. Yeah. that that I saw last summer when I had to do or not had to I took a well I had to because I had to finish my degree but I took a class um through uh Wilmington Wilmington uh that was uh, about film and history and it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be but it was still very uh edifying uh Dr. Glenn Harris gave that yeah I had him who as well. was a uh, very uh intelligent individual yeah. very smart uh great the point of being uh, intimidating he was one yes. of my favorite professors yeah. though at UNC Wilmington. um and uh, if you happen to some alternate universe Harris be listening to this yeah. I loved you and got yeah. a lot of your and classes. I and I and I am uh sadly was not able to meet him in person well I actually have met him before um yeah. when I was there but I didn't have the class in person yeah. so but he was he was great but he got us to watch a couple documentaries about the war on terror and specifically torture uh and all that so i'm well aware i've seen the and that and that's another thing i meant to say earlier is that growing up in this time that was made normal to me yeah which is something i thankfully am not at all that is not something that at all is normal to me now but that was something that i remember seeing the famous images of the guy standing on top of the box and and in the at that time seeing that as incredibly horrifying and being like what is that you know um, but I didn't ever ask the question of should we be doing this. It was more of just like I don't know what that is. Yeah. And, but of course now, uh, and that goes into the report. Um, yeah. Seeing that and saying no. Um, but that yeah. So I'm I'm aware and I've seen documentaries about that, but we have not seen standard operating procedure. Um, but yeah. and also you know there's not a specific one to point out, but the frontline documentaries I know that PBS produced and mid to late 2000s into the early 2010s. They still kind of make those, yeah. Those were influential for me to understanding these things in a little bit more of a subtle, nuanced way and understanding Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly was going on. Tier 5, fictionalization of leadership. And there's really two movies that come to mind. There might be more that we're not thinking of, and there undoubtedly will be more in the future. Yeah, because I can't think Um, of any. W from Stone in 2008 Mm. uh, about George W. Bush and Vice from 2018 about Dick Cheney. I don't really, frankly, have a lot of memories of things in W. I have not seen uh, W, so... So, yeah. I'm marginally know more about it than you do. Yeah. Um, you know, the most memorable thing about it, I guess, is Josh Brolin's George W. Bush. Um, and that's, you know, heavy on, you know, him inheriting as a lot from his father. Um, H.W.'s played by, I think... Uh, Cromwell, James Cromwell's that really? his name, I think, played hmm. H.W. in yeah. that. Um, Richard Dreyfus plays Dick Cheney. That was kind of sort of memorable. I kind of remember that. Um, Toby Jones that is movie, like Paul again, Rove it, or something. It, yeah. like, it almost treats it like a, what I remember of it anyways, treats it almost like a kind of a, a satire without a punchline. It's almost like uh, doesn't exactly know what to say and is a good example of you know what maybe let's wait till the dust settles on some of this stuff until we totally just jump all in and try to make something about it because Bush was still in office when this yeah. movie was made uh, because well, you know yeah. famously he made a movie he made his movie on Nixon in the mid nineties uh, Stone did and that was well after Nixon's administration um, and a lot of details that were not even totally known at that time about Nixon had come out over the years that yeah. of course are going to find their way into that um, and I think that again. It's an interesting example of trying to answer that in the moment, trying to make a movie about Bush. But on the whole, I didn't find it particularly memorable, and it's kind of drew, yeah, drained from my memory another, a little bit. One thing I'll say about that, too, that I haven't seen it, but what's interesting is that even a few years later, uh, Stone would make uh, Wall Street, Money Never Sleeps, a sequel to Wall Street. Uh, now, first of all, the original Wall Street, I have no clue what that movie's about. Mm-hmm. Um, that movie's 
nonsensical, frankly, in its narrative meaning. And not like its narrative makes sense, but its th- thematic meaning, I have no clue what that movie's about. Um, I don't really totally know what the sequel's about either, but I feel like it deals with the housing crisis with far more. Uh, immediate wisdom. Immediate wisdom than W it seems to have. So it's yeah. interesting that he would make that after that. And it I wonder too if sense, like but. you know, I think his father was wasn't he a broker on Wall Street? Yes, and and he had lived with that movie Wall Street for a long time, anyways. And so maybe that was a more immediate. Yeah, and he had to understand right. that were a little more yeah. than just making a big big George W. Bush movie. Right, I don't know. Yeah, but, but. Vice. Which turned out to be wildly divisive, uh, I think. Which um, I don't... Un- well, I understand why one side of the political spectrum would find it divisive. I don't really understand why the other would. We were both um, quite taken with oh, it. Oh, yeah. Love Vice. Yeah. That movie kind of puts forth the narrative that has been a lot of people bought into over the years, that Dick Cheney was actually more of the guiding force in the Bush administration than mm-hmm. W himself was. Um, what do you think about Dick, uh, Dick Cheney's portrayal of Christian Bale? Uh, <laughs> Christian Bale's portrayal of Dick Cheney and maybe how Dick Cheney functions in the world of the war on terror. Um, well, for one thing, I'll say that, you know, it kind of says, you know, that Dick Cheney's whole career was the culmination of decades of yes. experience in Washington, And I think that's DC. why I would buy into a theory like that a little more, that he kind of ran the show, even though I'm not sure how much that's the case. Yeah. Uh, the movie positions itself as that. Um, but because, I mean, he had more experience than... W. Bush. Well, he also in, served in under Washington. his own father, too, yes, at points, and right. is part of that whole yeah. cadre. So of it's neocons. true that he definitely lived in that world, but I, I would buy that because Cheney had li- had worked in Washington his for very much of his life and kept wanting that job. One of the funnier and, moments of that movie I always think about is when he's, he's the big moment early on when he gets in his office, now small and crappy it is, and he calls his wife up. He's like, we did it, honey. It's just yeah, like, and it's they're just talking like, about trying to make the macaroni. Yeah, and yeah, it's kind but of just kind of how pathetic that yeah. office is, and how yeah. for him that was a, such a big moment or whatever. Yeah, one of the things I also most remember about the movie is the very opening and the September 11th attacks happening, and uh, that was a very immediate like one of the few times I've seen a new movie in theaters where that was being depicted. And I, because again, a lot of these movies yeah. I didn't see in theaters. Obviously, I saw after the fact. That felt immediate and felt yeah. like was really capturing, grabbing you by the throat of that mm-hmm. moment of what that moment meant in terms of yeah. from Cheney's perspective, seeing that. Um, I think he was in the Naval Observatory, which was his main office, I believe. When yeah. that happened, I can't quite remember. And they were he's being escorted out right. of there, obviously. Uh, uh, yeah, but and there's the question the movie asks immediately of why is Dick Cheney's lawyer present yeah and that's kind of the whole point of the movie is his cutting uh, corners and like all, all the dealings the, yeah. that he did to yeah. get to the war on terror yeah um i think it's an amazing movie i think that people will look back on it i think in the long run and see it as one of the the most valuable movies that we have had uh and i know people personally that didn't like it so i yeah. or were so yeah you know uh, but I think it's... And, I, and you, know, you know, I do quite like it, but yeah. I also understand... No, I get it. Adam I mean, McKay taking on this yes. material for some people was too, a bridge too no, far. No, and it is a satire, and it, it has a lot of comedy to it. Uh, but I feel like, at the same time, it is more than taking the material seriously. I think it really is positing a lot of questions that uh, are important. Uh, yeah. So we won't go into all that as much of the political implications of what that movie says because it's all there and you're either going to agree with it or you're not. Um, but I think it's even more successful than something like JFK because that deals in direct conspiracy that I don't think is definitive. Whereas this I find to buy pretty easily. I mean, I, uh, but you know, yeah. whatever. But we we're both uh, taken with yeah. that. Um, now this is going to a little bit of a different area. And involves a lot of TV, actually. Yeah. Um, because we've talked a lot about film and a little bit about TV, but TV, of course, is going to play a huge role into how we've consumed and uh, dealt with. Because that is a weekly uh, documentation of America, yeah. you know, and more and immediate so, yes. than yeah. film is. Tier six spiritual nine eleven parables or parallels. Uh, some of these are very clearly connected to nine eleven. Others in a more uh, kind of above 
the view looking over trying to depict it yeah. and talk about America during this time. Just a few and we'll run through talking about each of these individually in a bit. Uh, Margaret from 2011, The Departed, The Sopranos, of course the TV show lasted from 99 to, excuse me, 2007, The Wire from 2002 to 2008, 24, which actually began in late 2001, lasted officially through 2010, but there's been some subsequent yeah. revisits and reboots of that. Lost from 04 to 2010, The Leftovers from 2014 to 2017, and The 25th Hour, which is made immediately in uh, kind of, I think it was kind of loosely being made when it was happening. Yeah. Some things were recontextualized about it. We've not seen The 25th Hour. We've heard over the years that's one of the better capturings of New York yeah. of that time, but again, we're just frankly haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. What are some things that stick out about some of these depictions? About There's a little bit more removed from these things about 9-11 and about the war on terror, but how are they still viewing it? As well, a whole or maybe a specific things. Uh, as far as I can speak briefly about the departed because that's something I feel like I have a good handle, mm -hmm. the best handle on out of these. Yeah, and I'll let you talk about Margaret after yeah. that because you, ha I, which I love, but you're going to yeah. have more to say about than me. Um, I think the departed obviously focuses very much on um surveillance on surveillance, and I think I think the Sopranos does with this yeah. as well. Uh the law enforcement surveillance of uh, criminals in the same way that they are now surveilling uh, terrorists. And terrorists are um, mentioned here and there. Right, in, in The Sopranos. In the, well, and in, in, and the, in The Departed, departed yes. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's literally a moment in the movie where Alec Baldwin says, Patriot Act, Patriot Act, I love it, I love it, I love it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's very clearly very much about being allowed to survey people in new ways uh, under the guise of protecting freedom. Uh, which is now being used on criminals. Um, so, in that sense, that's what it is. But also this kind of uh, overall disillusionment both within uh, criminal forces and um, uh, law enforcement ones. I mean, kind of really the big, uh, you know, MacGuffin of the Departed in Strange Ways are microprocessors, which they talk all the time about. Mm hmm that those literally being able to be used in cruise missiles um, mm -hmm. and stuff that they're selling to the Chinese, which can eventually be a possible problem, mm -hmm. uh, but that the um, that criminals are realizing and organized crime is realizing the worth of being able to sell these, uh, you know, uh, types of you know technology for weaponry to these other countries, being able to exploit. Uh, terrorism all in, in the these name ways, all in the name of money. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting kind of evolution of Scorsese's gangster yeah. epics is to go that way. Um, another um, along Scorsese with the movie surveillance. we wanted to mention was Gangs of New York, yeah. which came out in 2002, yes. I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and now that movie is, of course, a period piece set in the 1860s in the midst of the Civil War. But very famously, the movie ends with kind of this... Uh, um, flash forward of sorts to showing the graves of is Liam Neeson and mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Day-Lewis' yeah. characters who were these kind of rival gang leaders and kind of how the city of New York changed over the years and it's almost like you know this time lapse of you see how this these buildings were tore down and these came up and the, one of the final images of the movie is of the Twin Towers mm -hmm. eventually being in the background um, yeah and I think that that I think what that obviously is saying is that New York at that moment had really come together and that even these two... It's very strange because it's about something that is not at all about 9-11, but that uh, it's implicitly... The image is implicitly saying even these two men buried beside each other who were rivals are together in history. Yeah. Um, and that I think that it's this strange kind of... And I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. I think it's very interesting of Scorsese doing that at the end of that movie kind of... And, you know, that, those yeah. two examples are, frankly, the closest he's ever come to grappling with 9-11. Yeah. He's not made any movies that, and that's not, if he don't want to, that's his no. business. I'm yeah. not saying he needs to. But being a quintessentially New York filmmaker, um, you know, he didn't make some big 9-11 movie. And yeah. uh, the way that somebody even like Spike Lee has yeah. touched several times yeah. over the years. And kind of jumping off of that, one of the writers of Gangs of New York was Kenneth Lonergan, who made Margaret. So yeah, I'm Margaret... Gonna, um, you know, that was supposed to come out in the 2000s. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was shot in like 05, 06, 07 ish. Hmm. It was so supposed to come out in the late 2000s. There were a lot of post production problems with that movie uh, that forced Kenneth Lonergan to cut versions of it. And eventually, the version that came out in 2011 itself was hardly seen at all. And it was a little bit of a butchered version of itself. But as someone who's seen that and a more director's cut version of the movie, which in of itself apparently is not the final formal version of the movie that he wants to have seen, there's there's a, there's not like any radical differences between the two. Really, it's just scenes are longer and yeah. are allowed to breathe more. Now, Margaret itself is ostensibly about a tragedy or a disaster, but in a much more gra- you know small, gradual mm-hmm. human scale about a you know a teenage girl played by Anna Paquin. Um, who is really, you know, she's a teenager. She's self-obsessed. She's indulgent in herself. Yeah. She's kind of selfish, uh, but also capable of kindness or capable of uh, empathy in certain degrees, but is yeah. still a teenager above all else. Um, and I say this is someone who loves teenagers and teaches them every day. So I don't Yeah. Know. Okay. Um, who inadvertently distracts Mark Ruffalo, who's a bus driver, Based on the cowboy hat that he's wearing, and she's oh, I want a cowboy she's hat. She's gonna be going somewhere. She's gonna with go her out west father. with her father, yeah. yeah, who's played by Kenneth Lonergan. And he inadvertently causes, uh, he crashes into and kills a passerby woman played Play by, by Allison, Allison Janney. Janney. Yeah. Um, and so she feels, and the whole movie's about her feeling the sense of guilt, um, but not really being sure what to do with it because she feels as though she is responsible for this woman's death by distracting him. But it inevitably turns all that guilt into finger pointing and turns all that guilt into um, you're really the one who crashed into it and tries to kind of then change her story with the police, effectively trying to ruin his life. But then the whole story's already been locked and there's a lot of questions of whether or not she can change it and what that would mean. And kind of just descends into all this. The most fam- One of the most famous lines in the movie is Jenny Berlin paraphrasing this when she says basically, you know, we're not all characters in the brilliant drama that is your life something along yeah. those lines and you see that you know the movie doesn't really talk about 9-11 in any big big way there is famously a scene though kind of in the middle of the movie of her in her high school um it's kind of like a social studies civics slash history oh, sort of class that. yeah where they do bring up the attacks and um she's clearly in her own mind thinking about this yeah. incident and these very specific things, but she then turns all of that anger and guilt that she feels into demonizing people of Islamic yeah. faith and people of a different heritage than her, and this big argument ensues in the class. Yeah. And that's a good example of something that I think happens, you could kind of see happen anecdotally across America and people trying to grapple with this thing that they can't really get their hands on and channeling their anger or their displacement elsewhere. I feel like that's what that whole so movie's about. And so it's not, you know, explicitly a 9-11 movie, but it's a very, it's in the shadow of 9-11 yeah. in New York City. And characters don't actively talk about it a lot, but it is clearly this shadow, this cloud that hangs over the characters in sometimes explicit ways, but many times uh, subtle ways. Mm-hmm. What, anything else to add about No, that I think that's that? a great movie. One other thing I want to add is Jean Reno being uh, any Semite in the yeah. movie randomly. He's French, and, yeah. and I think that that's another interesting kind of counterpoint to th- her, that scene of her saying those things about Islam and mm-hmm. um, just a sense of people's inadequacy being, and, then, and, and fear then lashing that out into, into something right. else. And, yeah. you know. um, so, yeah, that's a. That's a great movie, but uh, the so, Sopranos we kind of already we, we talked could about, have a whole but, podcast where we talk about the many things about. You could even have a whole podcast talking about the Sopranos and this, um, because one thing I, f- I find particularly fascinating about Sopranos in regards to this is that it existed before nine eleven. It premiered in nineteen ninety nine, goes all the way through two thousand seven, and so things like this are very interesting to see how they, you know, it, what it was before, and how it changed as a result of this. I believe it was in season four, um, because I went back and looked. That was the first season after the September 11th attacks. I believe the very first mention of it in the show is Tony and Bobby at a diner, just eating, talking, nothing at all related about this. But then it comes up like, oh, how's your mom doing? And she's like, oh, she's fine. Like, she's kind of, she's okay. She's like nosedive since the World Trade Center attacks happened. And Tony kind of nods, yeah, yeah. 
And then he says, you know, Quasimodo predicted all this. And Tony's like, Quasimodo, what are you talking about? And he realizes he means Nostradamus. And that was another thing, too, that we could talk about maybe yeah. with the ephemera of 9-11. I remember all the specials that were like in the years after about yeah. all these prophecies and yeah. all these things that the Bible said or all these things that, you know, these old philosophers had said that, oh, they line up with what, quote, happened and like this. And uh, here we are 20 years later. Yeah. talking about it on this podcast yeah. but yeah i remember that too growing up well i remember specifically and that's another thing i'm glad you brought that up in the 2000s watching on the history channel all the end times documentaries oh, yeah. that were going on and i think that's part of that too which is strange because we had just had that with the millennium uh and people thinking well, it was going to be the end the of the truth world, of the matter but, is that happens every generation there's yeah. just a new coat of paint on that whole right. idea of so the end yeah times, you know? but that that had just happened with that, and then it happened again. And so. again, even you know, the very one of the opening scenes of The Sopranos itself in the first episode is Tony saying, "You know, I feel like I've come in at the end of something. Yeah. I feel like all my dad and his people. That was when quote organized crime was like at its height, and here I am, basically fighting for scraps. Um, and there's even in the show again, Sopranos has some surveillance of the FBI surveilling them, and this is based on reality. I know as well that Tony and some other Italian American gangsters go to the FBI and say, "Hey, listen, I actually think I do business with some um, more Muslim or Arab criminals who may have some connection yeah. with terrorist acts as a bargaining chip of sorts yeah. for them." Uh, and again, for Tony, it is a combination of this genuine anger, yeah, uh, of the sense of patriotism he feels, but also opportunism of him just yeah. saying, "Well, if this helps me out, uh, get me." A free pass instead of getting life in prison maybe right. i'll get 20 years in prison um you know a way to circumvent right. that um the wire um you've not seen that no. uh, the wire from 2002 to 2008 i saw it last summer i finally watched it um really pretty great show is about the whole nature of surveillance and one of the reasons that many of the police in that show are able to surveil some of the organized crime or the crime members that they have in that is because of federal fund increase uh, after 9-11. Yeah. And, oh, well. And also, again, that, you know, so much of the FBI and federal attention towards organized crime was then totally transitioned into the war on terror. And so organized crime actually saw a brief resurgence a little bit in the 2000s, right. although that's since been yeah. diminished severely. Um that again, the wire in of itself, while you know it doesn't have really any Arab or Muslim characters, there is some talks or concerns about. I remember on the docks in terms of uh, the shipping containers of things yeah. coming in that this could have a dirty bomb or this could have a nuke or this could have these weapons that could blow up in Baltimore and could. And so right. that's even more in the background, I feel like, than it was in The Sopranos. But it does feature a role and in, um, in federal and local police surveilling and you know watching out for people that they suspect to be right terrorists 24 is something that neither of us have really seen frankly much of at all i, I can't say no um but i know that was a huge talking point in the 2000s about its depiction of torture and this depiction of terrorism as being reactionary and retrograde mm-hmm. again haven't seen it so yeah i can't speak too too much on that although i will say this Kiefer sutherland seems to have a recurring interest in portraying such roles and yeah. things. Yep, because he was in A Few Good Men as well. Um, Even his character in uh, that Schumacher movie, I can't remember, Time to Kill. Oh, yeah. He plays like yeah, a right, that's right. right-wing Black nut job, supremacist. supremacist. Yeah. Lost is, I think, one of the more fascinating little things to be about 9-11 and around about. We were about the whole virtu- the nature of disaster and about the this collision of cultures. Very famously, Saeed, one of the main characters in uh, Lost, was the you know everybody has this backstory that it has an episode going back and telling who they yeah. were. Himself was a member of the kind of Iraqi Republican Guard, basically, and so he has this whole knowledge of demolitions and weapons, and um, that features into the plot of how we're going to get off this island. Right. But in of itself, is I would say a positive in the sense of depicting someone from this other culture in a fairly humane dignified way I would say yeah. uh, that was a, unfortunately a rarity at the yeah. time and then even just the n- nature of the plane itself being lost about it you know disappearing and that disaster mm-hmm. was obviously taking this idea and adding a sci-fi 
kind of thriller concept to this right. and jumping off and doing something much bolder than I think uh, people even suspected early on. Um, also, The Leftovers. And I think this is, along with Margaret, for me, one of the most fascinating examples of loss and of you know this helplessness that people feel in the midst of tragedy. Yeah. The Leftovers, of course, is an adaption of a Tom Parada novel, and I've not read The Leftovers book. I've read some other Parada novels like Little Children. Yeah. Um, but he all uh, Parada is a voice, I think, and it's reflected in the show that he co-created with Damon Lindelof, who co-created Lost. Um, of this sense of how can I move forward in the midst of this spiritual, um inadequacy yeah of, uh, the, uh, what you know what can i do to move forward in this with this sense of loss that again leftovers and i think the show a slight problem i and i should love the show it's one of my favorites that it sometimes felt like it was really more than two percent of the world's population that yeah. quote, disappeared but even that would of course have a massive questions that would be raised towards people in right. regards to religion yeah. as, with regards to everything um what about the leftovers? Do you stick out uh, as far as a depiction of this time? Well, I think, it, and and I just think it's one of the best shows that has ever been made. I, I mean. agree, but also that uh, I think that it gets it to the heart of almost uh, obviously uh, something akin to the rapture would be even greater of a mystery than nine eleven. Mm-hmm. But that I think it gets to the heart of as a metaphor for unfathomable terror um and the grief that that um you know is comes as a result of that and the uh fundamentalism and kind of sectionalism and factionalism that comes out of such an event um and uh the you know but at the same time the ability of people to move on Mm-hmm. And to appreciate what they have, and uh, form new and, loves and yeah, new communities right. and new things out of. And that. I think that that's what's so genius and worthwhile about a show like The Leftovers is that it likes to do all its little, you know, surrealist games. That it, well, I say that like, it sounds bad. It's great, but mm-hmm. you know, like it likes to be kind of like Twin Peaks, yeah. but it's actually really about something mm-hmm. uh, in ways that not that Twin Peaks isn't about things, but um, that it's a, it's very much uh, relevant. I think. I think too the thing about the leftovers that could be also sublimated in thinking about nine eleven is the fact that as bad as this is, is this a harbinger for something worse to come? Yeah. Now in the in case of leftovers, that's referring to the if that was the biblical rapture, does that mean the apocalypse is upon us? Yeah. And again, a little bit earlier, what you were almost talking about, all that apocalyptic discussion and imagery that we were inundated with in the two thousands, and again, every every generation has their version yeah. of. In the sixties, it was the nukes. Um, in the seventies, it was a lot of environmental things mm-hmm. actually that they yeah. thought about. Um, we're there again, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And in the eighties, it was nukes again. In the nineties, it was the internet. What does the internet represent? More of an abstract yeah. thing. And then now in two thousands, it was all about terrorism. A lot of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and now again, we're living with that. I think again with um, natural disasters and climate change. Um, but again, is this is this a harbinger for something worse to come? I think that in and of itself was a metaphor that nine yeah. eleven could fit easily into um i think that covers that i think tier seven and eight we can combine almost into one because it kind of refers to i had superhero movies and then just opiate for the masses these spectacles blockbuster cinema how did blockbuster cinema respond i think the most obvious ways we can see this is with superhero movies it kind of in the last 20 years has been when superhero movies saw a direct boom do you see that as totally coincidental, or do you see that there's a relationship between that and the after effects of September 11th? I don't know. I don't. I don't think so because I think that with superhero movies in the 90s, particularly the Batman movies um, in the 90s, and and uh, also a lot of those like Mask of Zorro, the Phantom, the those Rocketeer, Paul, those events, yeah. uh, the Mummy. I think that was something that was in the making. Uh, and then with the X-Men movies as well being a thing. And so I think that there was already a lot of that moving in that direction. Um, but also I think that if you look at the Marvel movies, um, that maybe... And frankly, those are a little bit yeah, further along. Right, but that's at the end later, yeah. of the 2000s. But 
Uh, I think that if you wanted to think about it in that way, maybe people wanted to escape into something that large. Um, well, the, but, but at the very beginning of the decade, non-superhero related, obviously you had the Harry Potter movies were mm-hmm. starting up and the Lord of the Rings movies were starting up. Yeah. And that winter of 2001 immediately following that. And that in and of itself was an escapist yeah. thing for those So maybe years. I think it's all a coincidence that these things happen. I just think that the success of them maybe is as a result somewhat of 9-11 in the sense that people were looking for fantasy um, or a clear cut heroes escape. and villains. Yes. Yeah. Maybe, but I, I still think that those movies were made and they would have been successful. So I think that's just a, I think that's more of a coincidence. It's just lined up with the yeah, time. Than, yeah, than uh, a direct result of that. But, mm-hmm. yeah. One thing that, again, I can't, I can't speak to what this really means because a moment like this is so far conceived ahead of time and um, is in and of itself its own thing out of the books. But a moment to me that means something, and I don't know what it means, but I just got a feeling about it, is after Gandalf's death in The Fellowship of the Ring, which again would have premiered in the winter of 2001, immediately following those attacks months after, of that sense of shock and loss that the Fellowship feels for Mm -hmm. Gandalf's death, I would imagine was a very... Some combination of cathartic and horrific moment for a great many yeah. people across the country, who would have watched that in the context of that moment in terms of this sense of loss that that portrays. Right. Um, yeah. Again, that's something that's was shot and conceived well in advance, but in and of itself, I think is unconsciously speaking to the moment in some weird yeah. way. And I, yeah, I don't know what the words of the I don't know what yeah. the vocabulary for that is, but I just feel like that is some expression of something you know yeah. I, I don't know what uh that is um some th- other things as well we kind of singled out um man of steel now man of steel that comes out in 2013 was you know the reboot of superman for uh the new quote dc movies um that call that got a lot of criticism justifiably in um its destruction of cities and you had started to see this in some of these marvel movies but that kind of took it to a whole nother notch yeah that was the same summer as well as Star Trek Into Darkness did some similar things in terms of destruction yeah. of cities, which was pretty horrific. What do you think? Did the, the audiences want to see these cities destroyed? Is some sense of Hollywood reflecting what we saw on that day or what our fears of? Like, what is the narrative or entertainment value of depicting such things? I'm struggling to understand. Well, we know very well that at this point in... Uh, superhero filmmaking they wanted to make it dark and gritty and as realistic as possible I think that that therefore comes as a result of that that um, you know kind of like what had happened with the Godzilla uh, um, yeah, after, or Gojira after the uh, atomic, bombs atomic bomb attacks and, yeah. I think it's a sort of uh, an expression of a national consciousness fear over these things and i think that's why this is happening and also maybe but, trying to say like as opposed to removing them from our reality let's inject these things yeah. into our reality um and that's the question do people go to these things because they want reality reflected in them or do they go to get the escape and to be yeah more candy colored and to be more removed from reality? well and i think that they hope that people will save the day yeah uh because even in Man of Steel, all the destruction that happens in that. It's like, well, Superman does defeat Zod, uh, so I get you know. You get what, though, so, the Batman versus Superman. It's like, well, yeah. Superman was a failure. He didn't get the job done. And yeah. I'm not saying that's an unrealistic idea. Yeah, but it is. Uh, it's like we are wanting to take these things that were once held dear, and to quote, grim them up and muddy them up, based on our own failures as people. So we feel like, well, if Superman can fail, then. I guess it's all right if we do too. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a sense yeah. of like muddying that up and say, well, that's not as special as we thought it was. Yeah. You know, I yeah. think that's something going And on. I think that people do want to see that because they're kind of sick. Now, I think. So. Uh, and I, I'm saying that even as myself too. A I mean, positive corrective yeah. to a great much of this, to me personally, are the Raimi Spider Man movies. Mm-hmm. Um, in the sense, there are moments where the cities. I don't know if destruction is the worst destruction inherently, but like, there's not like this mass casualties you can tell is going yeah. on. And that even a moment like in Spider-Man 2 where he's like stopping the subway mm-hmm. that, you know, Peter Parker is doing everything he can to make sure everyone on that subway lives. Yeah. That there is this intensity of, I got to make sure that these people live and don't die. 
that sometimes get lost in a lot of these superhero yeah. movies before or since. Really, the only thing I can compare to that, frankly, is the Reeves Superman mm-hmm. movies. Um, and even that first one, again, that first one came out in 2002, would have been not even a year later. That very famous shot of Spider-Man kind of in front of the American flag at the end. And you remember kind of in the climax where the New Yorkers are kind of you getting together. You mess with one of us, you mess with all of are us. Teaming yeah. up against Green Goblin and... Those movies, again, were being shot, I think, kind of around that time. I don't know exactly what the uh, I think they the would have been finished was. probably before would have been, 9-11. Have been shooting. Yeah. Um, but even that that uh, the uh, teaser trailer yeah. that very famously had, had yeah. you know, the uh, Twin Towers reflected in... Uh, uh, well, and there was that one teaser the, where the, the those guys got uh, like caught up in a web between the well, Twin Towers. Well, no, that right? was the teaser, and then there was, I forgot, yeah, yeah. the poster. yes. Of the kind of one of the main posters, it's now a collector's item. Yeah. Of kind of the Spider Man cow almost, and yeah. the eye, the reflection of the Twin Towers in the eye, and that's now again like a collector's item. Yeah. Um, then again, those movies, I think, among being just really good because they're good, first and second one, actively try, or again, this is before a lot of this obsession with these destructions really set in, and in those movies, you really truly do see Peter Parker and Spider Man trying to protect people, not letting this destruction happen, and just fighting somebody because. If you even remember the climax of the second one, it all takes place kind of apart from destruction of people. It's all about whether or not that reactor is going to explode over the city or whatever, but it kind of takes place away from... Yeah, it's like in a... Like a... Like abandoned warehouse. Like a dock warehouse or something. It's like at the water or something. Yeah. Yeah, Right. So, yeah. There is something to say about the fact that Watchmen was formally adapted in 2009... Um, now, there had been various iterations of that that had maybe been made. I think Terry Gilliam, there was a version that was going to incorporate... I didn't know that. Uh, ...or be around the time of 9-11, I feel like, um, that wasn't made. But what about the 2009 edition of uh, Watchmen? Do you reflect any of these well, things? Well, first of all, that uh, that movie's very apocalyptic, um, as uh, and the, as Watchmen was originally the comic book. Uh, In the eight, mid-80s. Yeah. Um, which also had to do with the invasion of Afghanistan, interestingly. Yeah. Um, but I think obviously the big thing with that is this uh, sense of uh, des- destruction and mass murder that occurs um, because one individual thinks they're saving the world uh, by doing that. Um, so I think that that very much goes along with that I- that uh, imagery of New York City at that time and uh, and that sense of apocalypse. Of mm-hmm. that era in the same and way. into that kind of the ge- overall general trend of making superheroes dark and yeah. gritty as well because uh, the movie has virtually nothing else to contribute or say other than that so yeah uh, I've written a really long review of that movie not to promote myself on a podcast this serious but uh, I, I talk about a lot of those things so if you're interested and in there's that, a good chance we may very well do a podcast on yeah, that probably. at some point uh, last one I think maybe to talk about with this uh is the Dark Knight. That's kind of almost the, yeah. the elephant in the room we haven't even addressed yet. The Nolan Batman films. You know, Nolan's arguably the most uh, influential director of the past 20 years in terms of how he's influenced so much of the direction of these blockbusters. Um, what do you think about the decision to reintroduce the Joker in the context of maybe a damaged war veteran of the you know Iraq War, the War on Terror, and explicitly to draw connections maybe between the Patriot Act, and what Bruce Wayne or Batman is doing to try to catch the Joker. What that maybe is suggesting yeah. about power. Um, in particular in 2008 when it was released. I mean, you not know, that long after that. I think that I think a lot of people have said this, but uh, it's pretty genius. Um, now, first of all, I think it's very, very complicated. Now, Lucius Fox in the film says this is wrong, you know, that mm-hmm. this is happening. But the movie, though... So Never. Tells us basically, to do. no, we got no, to do it. So that's complicated about the Patriot Act and some of that stuff, as far as all know. Because then the movie says nobody catches the Joker and he's not going to use it for ill gotten gain uh, because he's a protector um, of the city. And that he entrusts but, Lucius Fox to. To destroy it, once destroy it once. Yeah, again. so I guess he. So I guess in that way it kind of oh, well, justifies so it's good in it. this way, but not in that way. I guess way. it justifies it at least that it's destroyed mm-hmm. after the fact. But, um,. But as far as the Joker, I mean, I think that is a really bold, version. a very bold, very interesting, very perceptive uh, version of the Joker. Um, and 
Um, I mean, everybody said that, but I think it's it's very, and I, I'm I'm fascinated by the idea of of a terrorist essentially holding a a city hostage um, to uh, degrade uh, a sense of justice um, that the city and that he's making dear. this bet right. on that humanity will turn on itself, right? And in yeah. a surprise move, it doesn't. Yeah, so it's a very optimistic. Uh, movie actually in the sense that the prisoners yeah say no yeah we're not doing that you know yeah um and so in that sense it's it's actually a sort of on the surface complicated but ultimately good natured exploration of terrorism um in a superhero movie it's very i mean i know the dark knight is one of the most beloved movies of all time it's actually a very complex interesting yeah version of that that i don't think actually as much about as i should um, well, you know, but, just speaking as Batman fans, yeah. you know, we hold the Keaton movies and Burton movies yeah. to be very dear, and those are, I don't know, speak for both of us, I'll say those are our canonical Batman yeah. to us. Yeah. And we like the Nolan Batman movies, but we also are kind of like, I don't know if, quote, moving on at that time, but like there are other Nolan movies or other movies of that time that sometimes occupied our, I mean, when they were those movies were coming out, they were big deals, no question. But I'm oh, saying yeah. after the fact, they've kind of, you know, not, you know, I won't say not stay with, but you know, they just haven't. People love them, but they've kind of. They're I mean, just not. We, yeah. we should Marvel kind of took Dark over. Dark Rises itself mm, yeah. is even about terrorism and yeah. about uh, the dangers of a new what terrorism yeah. can do in modern yeah. cities. But but well. I think what you're getting at is the Marvel movies kind of obfuscated uh, superhero movies that DC lost out big yeah. time and uh, I, I sometimes wonder if the Nolan movies were worth it if that. DC didn't get on the bandwagon early enough, but also I didn't want them to do that, yeah. and I wanted them to make movies that were like that. Yeah. So ultimately, yeah. I'm coming back around to think and know that the Nolan movies were necessary, and that I'm glad those exist more than movies that try to replicate Marvel, yeah. because we're DC people in this household over Marvel, so to me what works about DC is their ability to not reflect reality. Yeah, in the way that the Marvel movies try to do, but that was a um, reflection of reality. In a it much was darker way. Than, uh, but I think that yeah. there was a point to that that was far more uh, worthwhile than yeah. than needing to do other things. But, sure. Yeah. Um. That about. So we it. like the Dark Knight. I know that. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a long so, roundabout way yes, of saying we do like the Dark anyway, Knight and yes. the Nolan Batman movies yeah. in general. Um. But we wanted to kind of end this talking about some other things, like weird 9-11 era ephemera that has kind of been lost to the cultural memory, but are things that... We are people, always going to remember. That yeah. Growing up in that time, we really remember. Um, for one thing, we've already talked a little bit, very briefly, I think, about Toby Keith and country yeah. music of the time. Um, that was just the soundtrack of the 2000s here. His, uh, un, his album, music. Unleashed, yeah. um, is, at least for me, a seminal pop cultural moment of the 2000s that I now laugh at but still find things about interesting and um but yeah uh and there it's weird is that for a long time that just seemed like the quote present day music and now it's all quote right in a historical context which is weird well, to no, think I mean about. you listen to uh courtesy of the red white and blue the angry American yeah. and it's one of the most laughable things I've ever heard it's so archly uh, nationalistic Re and reactionary, and reactionary. Yeah. I mean it's quite breathtaking if you've never heard that song yeah. go listen to it because I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that haven't heard it uh, because they're either younger or just didn't that just was not part of their life, life at all you would be shocked I think to hear that uh, how that song similarly there um, were other you know yeah. musicians responding at that time Green Day American yeah. Idiot that was I remember what a big deal that whole yes. album was yeah. even though I didn't really listen to it a whole whole I lot. mean the image of a white hand holding a red grenade right. uh, shaped, was it shaped in a heart yeah yeah like is one of the most stunning I'm not a Green Day fan, mm -hmm. I, just because I haven't heard. Right. It's funny because I heard them a lot at the time, but I never liked them. Uh, but uh, my music opinions were not worthwhile anyway at that time. But also that I just don't think I'd like them now either. But uh, but that I find that image to be very interesting. Well, it's and, interesting that and, you know yeah. music like that has to occur a few years after because in the immediate aftermath of something like that. You're not going to have anybody yeah. out there doing that. And so that's many ways of backlash yes. to 
a lot of the sentiments of yeah. people like Toby right. Keith. Dixie Chicks, of course, they faced a backlash as well. well they, and they've actually had a career resurgence, thankfully, not that I care particularly about them either, but uh, but the, um, which they've had, tr- their recent troubles have been about the name Dixie Chicks, and now they're just the Chicks or yeah. whatever. Which, you know, but, yeah. um, so yes, that was a big deal when that happened. I remember when they spoke out against the Iraq War, and uh, America went, crazy and they were their career was over essentially but um, america was at that time obsessed with freedom fries if one remembers yeah you know because because france was being critical of our foreign policy well can't have french fries well you know and something fries. that i realized when we were talking we were I, we read some stuff about this yesterday about you know, they mentioned freedom fries i finally realized why it's this sounds stupid but i finally realized why in the 2020 it was such a cool and I teach middle schoolers, so hey, you know, love y'all. But uh, in my day, mm-hmm. uh, the whole thing was either talking about A, uh, and we can talk about this later when we talk about this movie, A, how uh, Jack would, would have fit on the piece of wood in Titanic. That's all anybody want to talk about for some reason. I'm being dead serious when I say this yeah, is something I, that I people talk about. That, yeah. Or that, um, and this was years, it was like 10 years after that too, but people yeah. were still talking about it. Or the fact that uh, France never won a war, uh, and we yeah. had to do everything for them. And I think that all came out of that idea of France being critical of us, and it's like they're like, "Well, what have you ever done?" And we're and the freedom fries thing was the same thing as Liberty sandwiches with the hamburger yeah. and Liberty. Uh, what was it they called sauerkraut? Liberty uh, sausages? Sauce, or something. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, that's I mean that's a really stupid. Uh, idea to do something, something like that I had that, kind but. of forgotten about but you you uh, routinely remind me of uh, Saddam Says SEZ in Wizard Magazine was that? No, no, it no was that was Mad, Mad Magazine, Magazine. Yes. Never mind, never yeah, mind. Mad Magazine yeah. used to every and Mad Magazine was actually another unfortunate which it's interesting because Mad Magazine was such a big deal in the 60s and 70s and 80s particularly um, all actually those movie started in parodies, the 50s, like, yeah. yeah, um, but the um, which honestly, and I and I and I quite like Mad Magazine, but honestly, you look back on it, and it's probably kind of the dumbest thing on the face of the earth. A lot of that Most stuff basic, yeah. is really stupid. Um, but particularly in the 2000s, it was really in the gutter. Um, mm-hmm. and most of their comedy came out of lampooning uh the the Iraq War. Mm-hmm. Um. And so, and also mixing that with in strange a lot of strange ways uh, the Lucas uh, resurgence George Lucas yeah, resurgence right. with the uh, prequels pre- Star Wars prequels well, so it was a very strange time of doing a lot of those things that's another thing we forgot mm-hmm. to mention is the political nature especially of Attack of the Clones yeah um, and I think that is very interesting and actually very worthwhile I know a lot of people don't like that you're wrong. Um, but I find a lot of that to be really interesting. But anyway, a lot of people mm-hmm. talk about that. But the in Wizard or uh, Mad Magazine yeah. every week. Mm-hmm. And this was after the assassination of and uh, well execution of Saddam Hussein. They had this one picture of him looking crazy, him like talking. Yeah. And every week it would be him New saying caption. something different, and that was something that and that went on for just a little while after. Um, his execution for yeah. longer than it should have. By the way, if you're trying to look this up on the internet, uh, I have not been able to find this, but I swear it happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was a thing that really did happen. I, he's Kyle's looking it up now. I want to see if we can find it, but I, I don't know that uh, we can. I'm typing in Saddam um, Says Mad Magazine. Seen a lot of covers of things. Go back like, to recurring features in Mad. Actually, go go back to that those images well, real quick. Let's see if you go to recurring features in Mad Magazine. Saddam says. Yep, there it is. Three on the Wikipedia same page. photograph of Saddam Hussein speaking in his 2006 trial, where a balloon was added, making a random reference having nothing to do with Hussein or Iraq. March 2007, Mad contained a statement that due to the circumstance beyond our control, Saddam says feature would be put on indefinite hiatus. Del Castro later replaced Saddam with Castro comments. I never knew that. There was an image you that we just saw a minute ago that I used to have. Uh, that Dick Cheney. Uh, Twenty one, dumbest people and events and things of two thousand six. That uh, when that whole thing happened, where Dick Cheney shot that guy in a hunting accident, and the, and the guy had to apologize, to Dick Cheney. 
So I remember actually having that that yeah. issue. Um, but yeah, just uh, the total um, tone deafness. Tone deafness. I don't even know what the word is of yeah. that. It's just just staggering to me. I mean, I uh, oh ha ha. Like yeah. I'm not saying Saddam, yeah. I'm not saying no, no. Saddam Hussein was a good person. Saddam at all. Hussein was was. Uh, uh, a terrible dictator, uh, mass murderer in his own way. I mean, yep. you know, I have nothing good to say about Saddam Hussein, but it just really it goes back to what I've my ultimate thesis statement on what we should be going into to uh, the 20th anniversary of 9/11 is that I don't think anybody really takes this as seriously as we ought to, especially not in the moment because it was so. And I get in a way I get it, but it was so horrific in the moment that nobody actually wanted to deal with it on a serious this way. Is, this is the case with and, trauma all, always, yeah, yeah, and, whether it's interpersonal trauma or yeah. national trauma. People always say you either laugh or cry, and I'm like, well, we might ought to do a little bit more crying because I don't ever see anybody doing it. I mean, of course, they did in the moment. I'm yeah. not saying, you know, yeah. I don't want to act like people weren't deeply affected by 9-11. We all clearly were. But as obviously, as you get further from something like this, it's easier to joke about. But especially in that time, I'm still surprised that you would see on TV... Um, the things that I saw of the Iraq war that I've never really got, some things I've never really gotten over and that that was, oh, Saddam Hussein says blah, blah, blah. Well, like, that's just joke, yeah. really disgusting, frankly. Um, what about uh, Osama bin well, Laden's death? I think it's well, a little I touched bit on this already, but, you know, this happened again almost on the 10th anniversary of 10 years ago now, the yeah. uh, September 11th attacks. I'll never forget, um, we were watching. I was watching Celebrity Apprentice at the time that year. <laughs> It's um, something we used to do, believe it yeah. or not, just because that was the I, meatloaf it, Gary it was a hilarious. Season. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. Um, we've played clips of that on here before, so and, you know um, what it is. But when they interrupted and yeah. announced, Obama announced that um, uh, Osama bin Laden had been killed, and that you know, and this is something I feel conflicted about too, and I don't think there's any easy answers for this. The amount of joy and celebration people felt for his death, um, I can't even say it's wrong necessarily. No. Uh, because again, if I was somebody from the New York metropolitan area and who went through that day, of course I'd be happy that this man, even, you know, as somebody who was removed from that, I don't know if I'm quote happy he died, but I'm glad that he was out of commission from planning terrorist attacks. Yeah. I'll say that. I don't know if I can celebrate Just, a person's Some sort death, of justice was served. Uh, but yes. I don't know if I can really yeah. celebrate a person's death. No. Me personally. Yes. Um, yeah. And I'm not going to really make any moral judgments on those who did or will no. or want to, but I'm, all I'm saying is we need to think about the place of that. You know? Yeah, uh, and lastly, I guess bringing this to an end, thinking about all this, there's a lot of stuff. And in many ways, we barely scratched the surface. And I meant yeah. to say this at the beginning, and if you're still hanging with us at this point, God bless. Um, we're not trying to give any conclusive answers. No. We're not expecting to arrive to any mind-altering answers that no one else has been able to arrive to. But in some total, looking at all these cultural products, all these cultural responses. What does that communicate about our national consciousness over the past 20 years to you? Um, I don't really know because I think that uh, we've tried to deal with it in our own way. We've attempted to. And that's what I was going to say, too, is that um, we're still talking about it now, clearly, as we should be. But I'm even saying that I don't think we've talked about it enough. Um, but that I think it's so much easier to see these things on the big screen and see it and we feel validated that we're being seen in our grief but we are feeling comfortable about talking about that on a basic level or on their TV that's screen, a yes yeah. that and that's a human reaction i'm not saying it's even well i think it is wrong to a certain extent yeah. but i, I mean I, i'm not saying it's a surprise and i'm not saying i haven't done that but um i think that what you said is right is that we're still talking about this and still trying to grapple with it to the point where it's kind of faded out now, um, and a lot of people's understanding of these things come now through Call of Duty, yeah. um, and the things that uh, we have perpetrated in that sense. So what I am saying, ultimately, is I think we've sold our, uh, and I'm not saying people like me to be saying, oh, look at me, but people like me and younger than me, we've sold us short um, by letting the TV teach them yeah. about these things um, and we needed more people like our mom to sit and people did this in the moment yeah. but we've needed more people to do this later is sit us down and say this thing happened um, and you know we all are trying to deal with it you know and talk about how do you feel about that and what should we be saying 
ultimately, um, in a general sense, I think that um, what we should learn from 9-11 is to be compassionate to one another because I think it's so easy, and this, this goes beyond just this event in, in general. I think the parting words I have to say about this are that I think that in any political persuasion, there are people who believe other people are the enemy, and this person is this, and we have these prejudices against other people. But I know so many people in my life, and I think, and I, because I believe in America, I know that's something that is a controversial thing to some people these days, but I truly believe in the promise of America, and I believe that most, I, and, I, and I don't believe a lot of positive things about Americans sometimes, American citizens, but I do believe that deep down, we all, most of us anyway, actually want to be nice to one another and are helping out to people. That much can be seen in the events of 9-11, the way that people right. ran into buildings to save people they did not know. Right. I think that that proves that people do care about other people. So all that I ask on this 20th anniversary is for you to think about um, those other people and the people you don't know and think about these people in other places in different ways and think about why people have different ideas and do different things because we're all human and to not do that I think is we really haven't learned the lesson of 9-11 because those people who perpetrated those acts did not do those things they did not find the compassion for other people um, and didn't live in a reality that prized uh, human rights so therefore I think that's what we've lost um, mm -hmm. And I know that's a that's an impossibility, but it's not in that your mean own it shouldn't life, be a goal. yeah, right. And yeah. and it's not, and it is not an impossibility in the way you treat people. Right. So I guess that's all I have to say about that. It's all very well said. I, I, all I would really add to that is, um, again, as you said, to give ourselves over to a lack of empathy, to a lack of rationality, to a lack of respect for our fellow men and women is to give ourselves over to the same impulses that those that perpetrated the attacks did. And it's um because that is the that is the bedrock of extremism right. is to and again, not if we, listen and if, to other if voices. If we and, want to give ourselves yeah. over to that too, then um that's its own problems. And those consequences oftentimes feel like they're going to happen out of our eyesight and uh, to someone else that doesn't mean their lives are forever impacted by that anyways. Yeah. Um for me, I want to go back a little bit to thinking about those kids that were, saw it on the screen and were like, what is this? You know, mm -hmm. I don't understand that. Um, thinking about kids and children and the roles and legacies that these played. Just last night uh, uh, on CNN, uh, they had the 9-11 the classroom, which was mm -hmm. about the kids who were in the room that day that George W. Bush was on in and when he was reading My Pet Goat and when the, he got the news and he had to leave. And it was... It's really valuable to see this uh, caught up with the teacher who was there sitting beside President Bush as well as all the kids that were there present and kind of was almost like, okay, what's the last 20 years of your life been? And then recounting the day and then, you know, some of these kids, most of them, they went on to be successful and they got, you know, uh, they had families and they're married now. And I feel a sense of kinship to that yeah. generation because, again, I was uh, you were only a year third older grade than and they yeah. were second grade. So loosely we've had the same life experiences in terms of generationally yeah. um and i think about the kids of today in terms of this being even more of a foreign concept to them and I almost think about a hypothetical bookshelf that we're now kind of putting the 9-11 book if you want to call it that they're closing the chapter and putting it on a shelf and you know moving on from it and the same way that, as I said in the beginning, that, you know, Pearl Harbor or the JFK assassination, you know, as history people, we have understandings of these things. Or even the, Ab the assassination of Abraham Lincoln right. or, what, mean, or the USS Maine or yeah. whatever you want to yeah, yeah, like, throw you know, All these things eventually become texts on the yeah. shelf uh, to look at and view. Um, but to a great many people, and again, the JFK assassination, that's one of the more recent ish phenomenons that we can point back to that was of something of this magnitude mm -hmm. um that you know you talk about anyone who's dealt with that who saw that and remember that what that day meant um and it's almost like well it might be just a book on a shelf but that pain is not necessarily gone away from yeah. people and you know while our culture has moved on and i think learned some lessons um and not nearly enough you know this is humans that's not just an american problem that's a human problem um 
that all in all that there's still a great many people with those scars are still in the immediate yeah um and just to remember that and yeah. you know for those in if you ever you know have the opportunity to meet someone who maybe and i really haven't in myself, oh, i haven't uh, no. met someone who was there in new york that day and has very vivid memories is just to um you know take what they say seriously and because yeah. that trauma matters and if nothing else let this be an example of how a nation can receive a trauma and try to swallow it and move on from it mm-hmm. uh, more than anything else uh and as far as you know Another thing we wanted to end on, too, is just talking a little bit about the literature of 9-11. Because one thing I love about literature as an art form is that it's slower. It's yeah. more reserved, and it's kind of more patient than almost every other conceivable art form. Because every other one's got to be out now, got to be out quick. And not, not to say that people aren't yeah. pushing books out about yeah. this stuff early. Um, but how some of our best writers respond to this, I think, in many ways... Um, gives us a window into maybe some things that, in the immediate... Than here in the now that sometimes get yeah, lost. Right. Some books that you know um, it came out in that around that time or in the aftermath. I know um, the corrections by Jonathan Franzen was a book that uh, actually came out just a little, a little bit before nine eleven. So it's kind of about a lot yeah. of things before that, but kind of got swept up into that immediate fall and winter after that yeah. is a book about in some ways about some aspects of family and about legacy that in some ways could be translating into being unconsciously about that, even though, again, it was conceived of before that. Um, I'm nearly finished with reading Bleeding Edge, which is Thomas Pinchon's, um, very, you know, we go listen to our Inherent Vice yeah. podcast about Thomas Pinchon. Um, his own attempt to understand that day through a plot that involves a lot of things that seemingly are disconnected from that before that. Um, uh, that involve kind of uh, cyberpunk storytelling and like a lot of stuff about the dot com boom of the turn of the century. Um, and what's fascinating about where I'm at in that uh, just yesterday was actually when the events of 9 11 finally happened in the book. Um, that basically the whole plot of the movie almost gets just put on hold temporarily, yeah. and it's all about kind of dealing with the grief and the aftermath of all that, um, and the attempt by people to then take that event and use it to reinforce beliefs they already had about themselves or of others and to use it as more of a weapon than of, as yeah. a, uh, arms to hold people with. Um, and a similarity that has with uh, Don DeLillo's Falling Man, which can, that came out a little bit more immediately. The uh, Bleeding Edge was in 2013. Falling Man was in 2007. Don DeLillo's Fallen Man's similarly about... and. Bling Edge is about this too, about a relationship that was on the rocks, a marriage that was on the rocks, and then this event happened, and it kind of unconsciously brought these two people back together. Now, the way Falling Man ends, it leads us to suggest that's not a permanent situation, that that was a temporary bandage over a more permanent wound kind of a thing. Um, But, um, you know, what's also fascinating about Don DeLillo's work, and you can speak to this as someone who's read Mal too as well, um, that he very much had his finger on the pulse in many ways of some of these national trends, trends regarding terrorism, but also regarding uh, America's sick, twisted, sometimes obsession with entertainment that depicts these yeah. things. Um, and so we wanted to end today to also shout out uh, the brilliant New Yorker piece that was written. Um, it came out in, I believe, 2002. Yeah, uh, The Real Heroes Are Dead, which was about the... Uh, uh, Rick Rescalora, yeah. or Rescalora, yeah. Uh, um, Rescal- yeah, Rescal- uh, who's really, it's one of the most inspiring, all those sad things you'll ever read. That's out of anything to do with 9 11, I think that's the premier piece of anything. art yeah. that has to do with that because it's journalism, but it truly it tells is a story. Art. Yeah. yeah, and uh, you may start reading it, and you're like, "How's this about 9/11?" Because it, I think that's the genius of it is it spends so much time investing in the people but as it if basically they are tells characters. his life story yeah. of Rick and, right. um, and uh, his wife, right? In, and in that. Uh, the tragedy of that, but also I'm going to put a link heroism. to that in uh, yeah. the this episode. Yeah. So I highly recommend that. And there's also if you know it. It takes a long time to read, but I promise you it's worth yeah. it if you read it. And there's also even an audio version, which I have read it several times. I actually, re list I just listened to the first time the audio version yesterday, and that was a really good reading yeah. of it. So if you don't have time to read it, 
check out that audio version of it. Um, I think also that author, James B. Stewart, I think is maybe his name, uh, even kind of made a little small book based yeah. out of that and yeah. added some things I think as well too. Um, but Fall of Man, I know this is a tradition both me and you kind of practice in our own ways. I've read the book. You haven't quite read mm-hmm. it yet, but uh, read other Delilah stuff. Listen to this excerpt of him reading Falling Man every year. Um, and we're going to end the podcast kind of uh, with Delillo's own reading of Falling Man. Any other last thoughts or words before we end this podcast? Um, just that we we are in deep thought about this, um, and it weighed a lot on us to do this podcast. I'm very glad we did, um, and I hope you got something out of it just to really think about the events of that day, what they mean, um, and uh, we dedicate this episode to the memory of all lives lost um and yeah and as we said we're not presuming to give any answers any clarity any sense of closure but just two guys who of course were informed by these events to try to try ourselves to understand it a little bit better and uh hopefully you as you spend your 20 the 20th anniversary of this or even later on if you're listening to this whenever um Again, not maybe getting closure, but maybe a sense of understanding and maybe some sense of where we ourselves fit into this. Um, So, again, we're going to end with Don DeLillo here. This is Kyle. This is Levi. Take care. God bless. Two brief passages from Falling Man. Paper was flying down the hallway, rattling in the wind that seemed to wash down from above. There were dead, faintly seen, in offices to either side. He climbed out over a fallen wall and made his way slowly toward the voices. In the stairwell, in near dark, a woman carried a small tricycle tight to her chest, the thing for a three-year-old, handlebars framing her ribs. They walked down, thousands, and he was in there with them, one step, and then the next. There was water running somewhere and voices in an odd distance coming from another stairwell or an elevator bank out in the dark somewhere. It was hot and crowded and the pain in his face seemed to shrink his head. He thought his eyes and mouth were sinking into his skin. Things came back to him in distant visions, like half an eye, staring. The size of it, the sheer physical dimensions, and he saw himself in it, the mass and scale, and the way the tower swayed, a slow and ghostly lean. Someone took his arm and led him forward for a few steps, and then he walked on his own, and for an instant he saw it again, going past the window. The man falling sideways, arm out and up, like pointed up, like why am I here instead of there? There were long stalled moments and he looked straight ahead. When the line moved again, he took a step down and then another. They talked to him several times, different people And when this happened, he closed his eyes, maybe because it meant he didn't have to reply. It did not seem forever to him, the passage down. He had no sense of pace or rate. There was a glow stripe on the stairs that he hadn't seen before, and someone praying back in the line somewhere in Spanish. A man came up, moving quickly, in a hard hat, and they cleared a space. And then there were firemen in full bulk, and they clear the space. There were long waits and others not so long, and in time they were led down to the concourse level beneath the plaza, and they moved past empty shops, locked shops, and they were running now, some of them, with water pouring in from somewhere. They came out onto the street, looking back, both towers burning. And soon they heard a high drumming rumble and saw smoke rolling down from the top of the tower, billowing out and down methodically, floor to floor, and the tower falling, the south tower, diving into the smoke, and they were running again. 
The wind blast sent people to the ground. A thunderhead of smoke and ash came moving toward them. The light drained dead away, bright day gone. They ran and fell and tried to get up, men with toweled heads. A woman blinded by debris, a woman calling someone's name. The only light was vestigial now, the light of what comes after, carried in the residue of smashed matter and the ash ruins of what was various and human hovering in the air above. He took one step and then the next, smoke blowing over him. He felt rubble underfoot, and there was motion everywhere, people running, things flying past. He walked by the Easy Park sign, the breakfast special and three suits cheap, and they went running past, losing shoes and money. He saw a woman with her hand in the air, like running to catch a bus. He went past a line of fire trucks, and they stood empty now, headlights flashing. He could not find himself in the things he saw and heard. Two men ran by with a stretcher, someone face down, smoke seeping out of his hair and clothes. He watched them move into the stunned distance. That's where everything was all around him, falling away. Street signs, people, things he could not name. Then he saw a shirt come down out of the sky. He walked and saw it fall, arms waving like nothing in this life. Some days later, <clears throat> every, <clears throat> every time she saw a videotape of the planes, she moved a finger toward the power button on the remote. Then she kept on watching. The second plane coming out of that ice blue sky. This was the footage that entered the body that seemed to run beneath her skin. A fleeting sprint that carried lives and histories, theirs and hers, everyone's, into some other distance out beyond the towers. The skies she retained in memory were dramas of cloud and sea storm or the electric sheen before summer thunder in the city, always belonging to the energies of sheer weather, of what was out there. Air masses, water vapor, westerlies. This was different. A clear sky that carried human terror in those streaking aircraft. First one, then the other. The force of men's intent. He watched with her. Every helpless desperation set against the sky. Human voices crying to God, and how awful to imagine this. God's name on the tongues of killers and victims, both first one plane and then the other. The one that was nearly cartoon human, with flashing eyes and teeth. The second plane, the South Tower. He watched with her one time only. She knew she'd never felt so close to someone watching the planes cross the sky. Standing by the wall, he reached toward the chair and took her hand. She bit her lip and watched. They would all be dead, passengers and crew and thousands in the towers, dead. And she felt it in her body, a deep pause, and thought, there he is, unbelievably, in one of those towers. And now his hand on hers in pale light, as though to console her for his dying. He said, it still looks like an accident, the first one, even from this distance, way outside the thing. How many days later I'm standing here thinking it's an accident? She said, because it has to be. It has to be, he said the way the camera sort of shows surprise. But only the first one, only the first, she said. The second plane, by the time the second plane appears, he said, we're all a little older and wiser. Thank you.